Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here. Thank you for joining us for another one of these market Monday market updates. Really special, uh, special live for you today. We're going to be answering a lot of your questions, kind of explaining what the market is doing right now and uh, and getting getting you ready to invest. Um, going to start off with our Monday market update. So getting you ready for the, all the stocks I'm watching this week, the economic news, kind of how the uh, how the stock market looks. Then we're going to uh, then we're going to look at your questions I posted in the uh, in the Facebook group. Uh, answer those, and really, what I want to. I- more than just answer your questions, right? I really want to show you, you know, how I think through the process of investing and the economy and and the stock market at any given point, right? I want to show you the websites that I go to, the information that I look for, just to get a feel for, uh, you know, how to make my own decisions, so you can make your own decisions too, right? I don't want you always to be. Um, dependent on some Yahoo in a bow tie or anybody here on YouTube or, or anywhere else for your investing ideas and decisions. So I want to show you how to do that. I uh, see a lot of great uh, you know citizens of the Bowtie Nation there in the chat already. Ambrose, Deep Salmon, uh, good to see you there. Osteen, uh, Melanie, longtime member of the Bowtie Nation there. Ralph, good to see everybody there. Uh, we're going to also uh, do some live Q&A here with your questions in the chat as well. So stick around for that. And let me know you know what kind of formats uh, you like here. If you like this uh, this format where we're doing mostly question and answer kind of thing, or if you like to go back to the topic of the week kind of idea that we usually do, uh, that kind of thing. So let me know in the chat or in the comments there. Uh, I also want to uh, show you the... Uh, A free report I'm offering through The Motley Fool. I've got the link there uh, pinned in the comments in the chat, and I'll put it in the description as well. Uh, Check that out. Totally free report. It's the five stocks that I'm buying, my forever stocks, my buy and hold stocks, no matter what the market does, right? So it's absolutely free. You just enter your email. Uh, you know they're going to send you the uh, the email, the free report uh, that I wrote up for them. No obligation, absolutely. And you're you're going to be rep- uh, supporting the channel. So I appreciate that. Uh, it's absolutely no obligation for you. So just go ahead and uh, sign up for that, and uh, and you'll get that free report and help support the channel. So I appreciate that. But I want to get started because this is a big week for uh, for stocks. Uh, about a third of the S&P 500, a third of the stock market is reporting its earnings this week. Okay, that is um, about 164 companies in the S&P 500. Of course, many, many more companies outside, even outside that index, that broader index. But um, very important week for earnings and what companies say uh, about the the next coming quarters, right? It's what, what they're going to be saying about inflation, consumer spending over the next few quarters is really going to guide the market. So we want to be watching for that. And I want to show you some of the stocks that are reporting this week and what I'm watching. First here is UPS, a United Parcel Service. They're going to report their earnings tomorrow. Uh, it's following a historically bad earnings from FedEx, okay, in just a couple of weeks ago, right? We got that news from FedEx, missed its earnings estimate by the most in its history, right? And that obviously could be bad news for UPS because they're in the exact same line of business there. So expectations for UPS have uh, adjusted downwards on that, but are still they're still expected to make $2.84 a share, which would be about 5% growth over the last year. Now, that actually kind of strikes me as a high bar to set, considering that we did see FedEx report a decline of 21% in its earnings. Okay, so it's uh, it's a little odd how uh, the market still thinks that, um, you know, despite FedEx missing their earnings or seeing a decline of 21% in their earnings, then UPS can still uh, post a 5% growth uh, in, in their earnings. Okay, UPS does also remain the more expensive of the two stocks. They're trading for about 1.45 times sales, so one and a half times sales, versus about 0.42 times sales for FedEx. So, you know, I'd be a little cautious about UPS here. And uh, you know, and be watching for that Tuesday. Uh, obviously, it's also going to be very important to what they say about about shipping, about uh, you know logistics and uh, and needs for that. You know, if they say if they kind of echo what FedEx said about a slowing slowing demand for for logistics and uh, and shipping, then obviously that's not good for the economy. We also get Coca-Cola reporting earn its earnings on uh, Tuesday. It's expected to report flat earnings growth of 64 cents a share when it reports. Uh, <clears throat> sales are expected 7.9% higher. 
which of course that is pretty much the uh, the the same we've heard from most companies in the market, right? Those high sales growth, seven eight percent sales growth, but then flat earnings growth. And of course, what this is that's that inflation coming through to companies. Companies are able to boost their prices and, and pass a lot of those inflation costs. You know, the costs for the higher s- supplies, materials, the labor costs, things like that. They're able to pass that, those costs on to the consumer. Um, but they're not, uh, you know, the, those costs are eating into their earnings, so they're not reporting any earnings growth. Okay, so high sales growth, low earnings growth, and of course that's uh, that's not great for for the outlook on inflation because if companies continue to raise prices and see those high that higher sales growth, then uh, you know obviously if consumers are having to pay higher and higher prices and consumer inflation, then they're going to demand higher wages and. Uh, and it's also going to hit consumer spending. So you know, uh, we just see this trend of you know higher inflation through pricing, and uh, and it doesn't look good for inflation. But you know, I think the company uh, Coca Cola could easily beat expectations here on Tuesday, especially since Pepsi reported 10% earnings growth. Okay, so we weren't expecting much earnings growth from Pepsi, just like we aren't from Coke. Uh, they actually surprised. It was one of the big surprises of that week. Reported 10% earnings growth on its Q3 report. Um, so I do like Coca-Cola here uh, on that. I think while shares could bump on that better ex- better than expected report, it still is relatively expensive. Okay, uh, Coca-Cola is trading more expensive than Pepsi and, and fairly expensive at 5.9 times on a price to sales basis. So a little bit high, a little bit expensive for a you know consumer staples uh, company there with uh, with fairly low sales growth. We've also get uh, Alphabet, and you know I'm just I'm just kind of trying to point out, highlight a couple of the stocks reporting, the the ones I'm watching. But you know, with 165 stocks in the S&P 500, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of stocks reporting in the stock market reporting their earnings, uh, you you really need to check to see if your stocks are reporting this week because a lot of them are. A third of the stock market is reporting this week. So these aren't all the stocks, but uh, these are really the ones I'm watching. Uh, Alphabet Google is expected to report a dollar twenty-six in share earnings uh, and. A for a decline of 10% in the year ago quarter against uh, about an eight and a half percent increase in revenue. So again, like what we're seeing, uh, you know, higher revenue, you know, higher sales growth because they're able to raise their prices uh, on that inflation. But uh, all that inflation in supplies, in labor costs, everything in between, in between sales and earnings is really eating away. And it sounds like they're they're cutting the grass outside, so it might be a little bit noisy for about the next 15 minutes. So that gap between the sales growth and earnings uh, seems to be a bit excessive to me here on on Google, though. You know, for them to, for them to be able to report an eight and a half percent increase on year over year for sales, uh, and then a ten percent decline in earnings, so about eighteen, almost twenty percent uh, gap there between revenue and and earnings seems a little bit excessive. Uh, I think Alphabet is easily going to beat their earnings, but it's the outlook that worries me. Okay, for the uh, for a lot of these companies. From what we've heard from other social media companies, uh, there's really no light at the end of the tunnel, and there they go, right by the window. So that's nice. Uh, that should be it. It's a it's a really small patch outside the window, so that should be it for that. Uh, the uh, you know from what we've heard from other social media companies, especially Snap, uh, a lot of these other companies. You know, in the past couple of weeks, uh, there's really no light at the end of the tunnel for that online advertising. Um, you know, from from other companies. Okay, ahead of a recession, companies generally cut their marketing, their advertising budget ahead of laying off workers. So that's really the first thing that we've seen cut over the last, really over the last year, over the last three quarters, is companies cutting that advertising budget. Obviously, the com- the the websites like Alphabet, like Facebook, like Twitter, and and all those social media sites that run off that online advertising business model, right? They make all their revenue from online advertising, then uh, then that's really going to hit them. So I, I think, you know, it's a, there's a good chance Alphabet is going to have to warn on its Q4 earnings, which could spook investors, right? Uh, so I, I think they're going to come out, they're going to beat those earnings expectations, but they're going to say, you know what, we see no light at the end of the tunnel for online advertising rates, and, uh, and we might not hit those Q4 targets that, uh, that the, the market thinks we have. So that's going to be, uh, you know, that's a potential, potential uh, weakness for, for the stock there. 
in the same picture there, Meta Platforms, the old Facebook, uh, ticker META, is uh, likely to say pretty much the same thing on Wednesday when it's going to report its earnings. Uh, but it's uh, it would be hard not to cheer the market a little bit on meta platforms, right? You know, the expectations are so low. Earnings are expected 41% lower from last year to a, just $1.89 a share. Um, are expected to report a 5.5% drop in revenue. So like what we've seen with Google there with a 10% increase in revenue uh, and only a 10 per, or about a 8% increase in revenue, only about a 10% drop. You know, you compare that to what's expected at Facebook and uh, it just strikes me that uh, Facebook has just sold off so much uh, over the last year, right? So uh, shares of Meta are trading at 3.8 times sales, uh, by far the cheapest among the social media platforms. If you look at, you know, you can look at the, compare the, compare the valuation statistics on these, um, so we'll go to statistics here. This is Meta Platforms. Uh, all this is free on Yahoo Finance. You find it here. So, and then you go to you know price to sales. I like price to sales better, folks, because you know it's just a little bit harder to manipulate sales to sales numbers than it is earnings, right? A company is going to report their sales, going to report their earnings, all those other numbers on their financial statements. Um, but the earnings are subject to a lot of manipulation by management. Okay, this is something a lot of investors don't understand that by by the time you see earnings there on the income statement, they've been able to manipulate that with all kinds of uh, shenanigans and, and tricks to make those earnings look higher if they want to. So a lot of times that trail that price to earnings ratio isn't always what it seems because those earnings are artificially inflated up by accounting. So that's why I like to use price to sales here. And we do see with Meta, with Facebook there, uh, price to sales trading at 3.1 right now. Okay, 3.1 times on a price to sales basis. If you go to some of these other, you know, some of the other uh, social media sites like Pinterest, we'll do Pinterest first. Oh, that's Pinduel. We'll do Pinterest. Okay, if you go to something like Pinterest, you're gonna see, uh, and you do statistics, Okay, you see Pinterest is trading for 5.3 times on a price to sales basis. You can do uh, Google. We'll go back to Google, and actually that was right here, but we'll go to statistics. And you see Google is trading for 4.8 times. Okay, remember uh, Facebook was just 3.1 times. Uh, obviously, Twitter is going to be uh, much higher because it's got that buyout offer from Elon Musk. So Twitter is actually uh, very expensively priced here. Um, trading for 7.7 .7 times on a price to sales basis. So you look at all these and you know, yes, I, I know uh, I know everybody's got existential questions about Facebook, you know, whether it can remain the king of, uh, you know, the king of, of online uh, social media platforms, that kind of thing. But have you started, have you used Facebook any less? You know, I know I haven't. I, I know the, the site is still reporting very strong, um, very strong usage, very strong monthly users. Uh, and what I like about Facebook is they not only have that that main Facebook uh, you know platform, but they also own WhatsApp, um, the Messenger, they own Instagram, and Instagram is still the number one uh, downloaded app on uh, you know on a lot of on, on Apple and and uh, and Google, right? So Instagram is still very much popular with uh, with different generations, uh, and I think just this just says that uh, you know Facebook is very attractively priced here. Um, so I'd I'd be looking at, uh, again at Facebook. I think eventually, obviously, eventually the the ads ad revenue situation or ads ad advertising uh, rates are going to rebound with the next. Uh, with the next bull market, with the next economic growth cycle, and and that's when you're going to see these sh shares really take off. Uh, Teladoc Health. Teladoc Health is going to report its earnings on Wednesday. That's ticker TDOC, um, and I think they they have a good ch chance of surprising higher. What we've seen with Teladoc Health over the last two quarters has been they've really been surprising the market with a uh, with a massive write down of its assets in the previous two quarters okay writing off that goodwill on the balance sheet uh, and they actually wrote it off from 14 and a half billion down to 4.8 billion over the last couple of quarters now what this means is folks a lot of times when a company buys another company then obviously it's paying more for you know for that company than, than just what the assets are on the on the balance sheet right on the balance sheet a company reports all its assets uh, and that's really kind of what the company is supposed to be worth okay 
you know, minus the liabilities, the cash, that kind of thing. But uh, those assets on the balance sheet, that's everything that a company owns. It's products, uh, things like that. It's long-term, uh, you know, long-term property, plant, and equipment, things like that. Well, when a company buys another company and it pays more than what those assets are on the balance sheet or, or more than what it's priced at in the market, then it has a, you know, an extra there that it has to account for. And what it does, it just kind of says that's goodwill. That's, a, you know, that's a, a separate part of the balance sheet that it puts on its balance sheet called goodwill. Uh, and, and it's just kind of that catch all for, hey, we paid more for a, a company than what its assets were. Okay. So they're going to move their assets over uh, over to the new company. They're going to mark up that goodwill uh, for a certain amount. And it's just a kind of an idea that, uh, okay, there is more value in this company than just in those assets. There is, you know, intangible, intangible uh, value in a company more than just its assets. Well, what happens when uh, those acquisitions don't go as planned and they don't add quite as much to a company's value is, you know, management has to look back and say, okay, you know what, we were wrong. We shouldn't have paid too much for these other companies that we acquired. That's what's happened to Teladoc. It's what's happened to a lot of companies lately over the last year, right? Obviously, the assumption on these acquisitions was that uh, these companies, uh, the economy would keep on growing and uh, these acquired companies would be so worth so much more to the, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, acquirer. Uh, so what happens when that ha when when they do that is they have to write off that goodwill on the balance sheet. They have to say, okay, you know what? We paid too much for this company uh, when we acquired it. We're going to take off some of that goodwill. We're going to write off that uh, that we that we put on our balance sheet. And that's what Teladoc has done over the past two quarters. It's caused them to horrifically miss their earnings expectations uh, by the tune of almost ten billion dollars. Okay. And it's made uh, it's made earnings look much worse than they actually were. Okay, if we scroll down here in Yahoo Finance, we can see those last two quarters. You know, it was expected that they would only miss 56 cents, uh, or they would only lose 56 cents a share in the first quarter. They ended up losing 41 dollars. Uh, okay, in the second quarter, it was just as bad. They were expected to lose just 64 cents a share. They ended up losing 19 dollars. And you know, they actually ended up, you know, losing a little bit less than those estimates. They actually lost less than 64 cents a share in the second quarter, less than 56 cents a share in the first quarter. So they actually beat, uh, you know, on those core earnings, um, those core earnings estimates, but those write-offs, those write-downs of that goodwill caused them to to report so much, uh, such a such a bigger loss there, and it really shocked the markets and has and has helped bring the uh, the stock down. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, I don't think that's going to happen when they report their earnings on Wednesday. I think they've written off pretty much all the goodwill on their balance sheet that they're going to. So I think they're going to be back to uh, pretty close to what the market expects on earnings, and I think uh, you know that could be that could be helpful for the stock. They're actually expected to report a loss of 53 cents a share, uh, about the same as a year ago quarter. Sales that grew 17% over the period. So, you know, this is a, still a growth stock. This is why I'm holding this company. Um, it's still a growth stock. It's still the dominant leader in virtual healthcare and a very much a growing industry and very much changing the way we, we look at healthcare over the next few years. So, you know, I'd be taking a, another look at Teladoc Health. Uh, Apple. Apple is going to be reporting its earnings here later in the week on Thursday. Obviously, everybody's going to be watching Apple. Uh, going to expect it to report $1.27 a share. It'd be about 2.5% higher from the year ago on sales growth of 6.6% .6 over the period. Now, what's what's uh, really interesting about Apple is lately there's been reports that management has told suppliers to to really slow or stop the production of those iPhone iPhone 14 accessories. Um, it's really dogged the stock lately. You know, um, obviously, if management has seen uh, you know demand for iPhones and that iPhone 14 uh, really slow so much that they're telling their suppliers, hey, you know, slow down on that production of the accessories because we're not going to need it. There's not going to be the consumer demand. Uh, company is only expected to have sold about as many phones as it sold in the same quarter of last year, uh, which means that inflation and a stronger dollar could be the deciding factors here that, that weigh on results. Okay, what you got to understand, and it's something we're going to talk about later, the effect of the dollar on especially a lot of these uh, tech stocks that sell, uh, uh, make a lot of their revenue overseas. Uh, the stronger dollar means when they, so if they, you know, Apple selling all these iPhones overseas. Uh, getting those foreign currencies when they exchange those foreign currencies for the dollar and the dollar has risen so much as it has over this year then 
it's just naturally going to lower their earnings, right? Because they're translating these these weaker currencies into a stronger dollar. They're getting less dollars uh, for for these currencies for these sales than they expected, uh, and it's really weighing on sales. So we're going to talk more about that. But but I think that as well as inflation could be a really the, the deciding factor that that kind of spooks uh, Apple investors this week when they report on Thursday. What else here? Uh, also want to check out what the sectors did last. Oh, one more. Let's do uh, let's do Alibaba. This is one of the uh, the one of the big ones trading in the uh, in the pre market today. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be the big news today. I think these Chinese stocks um, falling by double digits, eleven percent down in the pre market for Alibaba. All those, you know, Pindua, Neo, all those Chinese stocks are really plunging in the pre-market. Uh, and it's basically because, uh, you know, President Xi of China really shocked the markets uh, over the weekend with his control, with his tightening grip on the Chinese, uh, Chinese leadership and Chinese government. Now, we were obviously expecting Xi to, to take a third term. You know, it's, it's pretty much control of the government there. Uh, we, so we were expecting that, but we weren't expecting really the the length that he's gone to to pack the government with his kind of his cronies, right? So it's going to be kind of an echo chamber in China. It's really all about Xi and his his agenda, uh, what he wants to do with the economy and with companies. So that's kind of spooked the markets, you know, how how much he's tightened his grip on the uh, on the economy there over the weekend. So that's why you're seeing a lot of these uh, a lot of these Chinese stocks fall so much in the pre market. Now I I do own shares of Alibaba. I'll probably play, pick up some more shares on this. So, you know, sixty four dollars a share is where it IPO'd at in two thousand fourteen. Okay. So for you know for investors that that were in there at that hundred and eighty dollar uh, high about just uh, just in the last year, uh, that sucks. You know I mean it does suck. It, it was, they were way too high then. Uh, it is a good company. It's a ver fairly attractive uh, on valuation. Uh, but we do see you know all these problems with the Chinese government cracking down on their tech companies. They have over the past year they have said that their their reviews of tech companies are coming to a close and, and they're going to you know help support the economy by kind of letting off some of these companies. So, you know, I think this is kind of a, just a knee-jerk reaction to the uh, government change over the weekend. Uh, and sixty-four dollars a share for Alibaba is very, uh, very attractive. It's something I want to uh, I want to pick up more shares on for that. Now I'm going to look at the what the sectors did, kind of give you a broad uh, overview of the markets, uh, what the sectors of the economy did. Obviously, here we are in the sectorspider.com. Everybody, all you out there in the nation know this is one of my favorite tools that I'm looking at to kind of get, get that big picture feel of the economy. Uh, so we're here in tools, sector tracker, and we can come down here and we can change this to five days to see what happened last week. Uh, very strong last week, 4.7% up on the S&P 500 on that stock market index. Uh, that was the best week since I think May uh, I saw that reported. Very strong bounce back in the markets, really on that those those I, that idea of a Fed pivot. Okay, folks, this is really what the market is trading on right now, why it's rebounding so much is the the idea that okay we are starting to see cracks in the economy the housing market is crashing uh the jobs pickers picture while it still looks good then uh, we are seeing some uh, some higher you know higher layoffs and, and thinking that we might see higher unemployment here over the next couple of months so the market is just thinking that okay you know, it's about time for the Fed to start saying we're going to slow down our rate increases. We're going to slow down our, uh, you know, or pause those rate increases. And of course, that would be good for the market because that would that would slow down, you know, the uh, the Fed trying to contract economic growth. I don't know that I'd necessarily see it. I, I think this is just another bear market rally like we've seen so many times this year uh, because, and this is, uh, again, something we'll talk about more in a little bit. I'll show you the rates picture, um, what we're going to see for interest rates over the next six months. And looking at that, looking at inflation, looking at the jobs market, I just do not see a slowdown in the Fed rates, rate hike cycle. Uh, so I think, you know, investors are going to be ultimately disappointed, you know, over the next couple of weeks, over the next couple of months, uh, because they're, they're getting a, a little ahead of themselves on the, on the market. But we did see each of the 11 stock sectors close higher last week. Energy rebounded off the prior week sell-off, so we had a huge drop in energy stocks the week before. Those rebounded 8% less last week as uh, oil prices just started to, uh, to come back up to normal. Now, uh, that's one of the things that, that I've talked about over the past few weeks is that as much as energy stocks have done this year, up about 53% so far this year, and really the only sector that's in positive territory, there could, be, uh, there could still be more upside in stocks 
in the energy sector. Okay, we've st we are, uh, we're starting to talk about the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the SPR, which is uh, its max capacity holds about 700,000 barrels of oil. Okay, that's the uh, the SPR. United States a Strategic Petroleum Reserve, really just a you know a cave, a cave with hundreds of millions of uh, barrels of oil for for use in you know economic distress. Uh, if OPEC decides to shut off America with its oil, things like that, and that holds seven hundred thousand or se excuse me seven hundred million uh, barrels of oil at its capacity. We've now drawn that down to four hundred thousand. Okay, it's a it's the lowest since nineteen eighty two. Uh, President Biden has been taking about a million barrels of oil out of there a day to keep oil prices down. Right, and it has helped a little bit. Uh, we we saw those oil prices peak at one hundred twenty dollars a barrel in March. They've since come down to around mid eighties eighty five or so. Uh, but you got to understand that's not something we can do forever. Okay, there is no end really to this situation, to the undersupply situation. Okay, uh, the Russian oil is still off the market, only available really to India and China and some of those countries that that are buying uh, Russian oil. You know, we still have some problems with uh, oil production in other countries. The U.S. production has not kept up with uh, demand. So we are still in a very much undersupplied situation for oil. And that's going to that's going to persist for months and years. OK, so what happens when we can we can no longer withdraw from the SBR? We can no longer withdraw those million barrels. And we're talking about that, you know, into December and January. We're going to run out of capacity to really take those oils out of the SBR. So that's going to be about a million barrels of oil that we have on the market right now, million barrels a day that we won't have. Uh, we won't have after that point. I think that's going to be a real big support for oil prices. Uh, eventually, we're going to have to start putting oil back in that uh, that SPR to refill it to its capacity, right? So if you just consider that alone, okay, a million barrels of oil a day, that's about as much as Libya produces, okay, a whole country. We're basically adding a whole country's worth of supply onto the oil market right now. Well, what happens when we stop doing that? What happens when we start adding to it a million barrels a day, okay? That's two million barrels. That's basically like two Libyas, you know, uh, worth of oil you know, that are coming off of the market because we're not only not only are we not supplying the oil market with that oil, but we're taking it off the market to refill that SPR. So I think that's going to be a real strong, uh, real strong support for oil oil prices. Um, even in the face of a recession, then uh, then you know I think you have real strong support for oil prices and, and these stocks in the energy sector are just cash flow machines. Okay, they are most of them are profitable at oil around forty or even fifty dollars a barrel at the most. So even if oil comes down to eighty dollars a barrel or seventy five dollars a barrel, uh, they are going to be cash flow machines and going to be rewarding investors with those dividends and buybacks and and things like that. So definitely something you want to watch for in energy stocks. Miners in the material sector did really well last week as as the value of the dollar started weakening a little bit and, and on stronger earnings. Uh, we talked about copper over the last couple of weeks. I think copper is one of the best stories for investors over the next three to five years. Uh, a lot of the supply demand situation we see in oil is also going to be hitting copper. Uh, we are running. We're. I showed you a couple of weeks ago, I showed you the uh, copper supply demand estimates over the next couple of years, and we are going to be in a copper deficit by 2024, 2025 at the latest. Uh, so, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs with its report out saying that they, they see copper going from about $350 a, a pound right now to $750, uh, $7.50 a pound by 2025. So, uh, you know, definitely something you want to be watching in copper and a lot of these. Uh, as expected, the, the underperformers last week were the safety sectors, right? Healthcare, consumer staples, utilities, uh, as it really investors rushed to, to put their money in some of the riskier stocks, right? That's generally what you're going to see in a market uh, market rebound. You're going to see uh, investors take money out of these uh, these safety stocks, right? The the stocks that they put money in to kind of protect their money, the consumer staples, the healthcare, which is the drug makers mostly, there the utilities, um, and they're going to put it in those uh, riskier sectors like technology, consumer discretionary, consumer services, um, and, and of course that's just the opposite when the market sells off. Okay, the market sells off, people rush out of investors rush out of these riskier sectors and they put it in the safety sectors right so that's uh, that's what I really what I was watching for uh, in uh, last week I want to ch talk about uh, what we're talking about or what we're looking at next this week and uh, and then I'll get to that that question and answer session 
you know, uh, again, a fifth of the co companies in the S&P 500, about 20% have reported Q3 earnings so far. It's about 70, 72% of them have beaten expectations for growth. Now, I know that sounds great, but just to understand that 73% is the average for companies that beat their expectations. Okay, so you see, you, you see all these companies report their earnings, uh, you know, in the market, and they, they beat expectations, they do great. Uh, and you think, oh, well, hey, the management must be doing a good job. No, it's kind of a game, right? Um, you'll see what we see is management uh, kind of guides lower. They they warn uh, the market that your earnings in the future might not be so great and might not be what's expected. Uh, and that brings down those expectations for future earnings, okay, over the next couple of quarters. Of course, and a lot of that is just so they can, you know, in turn, beat those expectations as well. So again, the average for companies beating expectations is about 73% of the companies reported. So that 72% is actually a little bit lower. You know, so uh, uh, there there have been warnings uh, for growth there. Uh, companies are reporting uh, just one and a half percent year over year earnings growth on eight and a half percent revenue growth. So if that persists, it would be the lowest earnings growth since the pandemic. Okay, so one and a half percent year over year earnings growth is extremely low, uh, and, and I think that does get lower. That does become. Um, you know, that, that could even be negative by the time we start seeing first quarter and second quarter earnings of next year. As we fall into a recession, obviously, you know, one of the hallmarks of a recession is lower earnings for, for corporations. So I think that uh, that one and a half percent we're seeing now moves into a, um, into a decline for next year. Uh, again, a third of the companies, 165 companies in the S&P 500 are going to report their earnings this week. That's the busiest week of the earnings season. Uh, warnings for the upcoming uh, season or upcoming quarters have really yet to spook investors. But, uh, you know, the, we are seeing warnings. We are seeing a lot of negative warnings and a lot of expectations lowered for future earnings. Uh, we're going to look at the earnings expectations here in a little bit. Uh, the investors now expect the S&P 500 companies to report 2.7% earnings growth on 5.4% growth over the last three months of the year. So that would be Q4. Those are going to start coming out in January. So, uh, so the market is expecting a little bit higher earnings growth for the last three months. Obviously, you know, holidays, shopping season, things like that. Five point four percent sales growth. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, Thursday, we're going to see the uh, first estimate of the third quarter GDP. Really going to be one of the big news uh, news items of the week. As you remember, uh, the first two quarters of the year for the United States, we saw negative economic growth, uh, negative GDP growth of 0.6% in the second quarter. Really started people talking about a recession, right? Because you know a lot of people consider a recession when you get two quarters, two back-to-back -back quarters of negative GDP growth, negative economic growth. And that's actually what we saw in the first half of the year. Uh, that's not the official the official technical uh, definition of a recession that uh, you know that the government uses so they didn't announce that we're officially in a recession but you know if you're if, if anybody out there you know it feels like a recession you know you see uh, you see the gas prices going up so high and, and so many people you know uh, in the labor force um, I think it's likely there there's very likely uh, we're actually reporting the economy to grow 2.3 percent over the last year uh, and it's likely we see a stronger than expected growth there maybe two push two and a half percent or higher um, one thing I do want to show you here uh, kind of what I follow for the GDP estimates and, and it's been really spot on uh, in the past you go to the Atlanta Fed GDP now. Okay, so if you type in Atlanta Fed or GDP now into Google, you'll find it's the first one here. The GDP now Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, and they track, uh, you know, they track all these economic statistics that feed into the economy and kind of give you a, uh, you know, a, a rolling, a rolling estimate for what they think the the GDP or the econ economy is going to be reported at. So far, as of October 19th, you know, they're saying about 2.9% for that third quarter GDP. And remember, the market is only expected about 2.5%. Uh, Atlanta Fed GDP now is tr tracking right around 3%. Uh, and, and what I think we're going to see is, is, yeah, you know, we see a lot of the... A lot of the things that brought the economy down in the first and second quarter, you know, the uh, the supply constraints and, and things like that, kind of work themselves off. So we do see a, a surprisingly strong economy in the third quarter. That's, um, you know, the the jobs picture is still very strong. We're still string, seeing strong sales growth, if not, you know, even earnings growth from a lot of these companies. So I, I think we are going to see that, uh, you know, when the when the government reports its first estimate for GDP here on. Um, you know, here later on in the week, 
Uh, that's not necessarily a good thing for the markets, though. Okay, higher, faster economic growth right now is a bad thing for the markets, actually, because it just means that the Fed is going to have to continue to raise interest rates to slow down the economy and slow down inflation. Okay, so folks, I I'm sorry, you do not get lower inflation with, uh, you know, this strong jobs market with historically low three and a half percent unemployment and, uh, you know, and, and a strong economy with a rising economy. We have to have some, if not recession, then very close to it to slow down that consumer spending, slow down inflation. And that's the only way that the Fed is going to be able to do it and be able to slow down uh, interest rates. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why I don't think that we've seen the worst of the bear market. Okay, again, as we talked about before, investors are uh, really playing on that idea of a pivot by the Fed. Investors are hoping that pretty soon the Fed comes out and says, okay, you know what? We've raised interest rates fast enough. We're going to wait and see uh, those interest rate effects on the economy. So we're going to slow down or even pause our interest rate hikes. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, the investors are buying back into the stock because of that. I don't know that I necessarily see that. Okay, the Fed has been very clear, very explicit on what it sees in the economy that the inflation rate has not slowed nearly enough uh, to to warrant a slow or a pause in its interest rate hikes, and it doesn't want to seem weak. Okay, that is a big thing for the Fed right now. Is it was so late to the game in raising interest rates, it lost a lot of credibility. Okay, the, everyone was screaming that the Fed needed to raise rates off of zero, uh, and, and they didn't. We ended up getting this uh, decades-high inflation. So now the Fed has to come back and say, okay, you know what? We are serious about inflation. We are going to raise rates until inflation comes down. Okay, and so you know any news that the Fed comes out and says, uh, okay, we are going to slow down and pause our interest rate hikes, if that comes before inflation, uh, inflation does come down and start coming down, the market's going to think the Fed is weak. The market's going to think that the Fed is backing down from its inflation pledge, uh, and and you know it's it's just going to cause more inflation, right? Because um, you get higher higher asset prices. Companies, businesses are going to say, okay, well, if the Fed stops raising interest rates, then we can we don't have to worry about the economy so much anymore. So we can start you know continue to hire more people and continue our business spending and things like that. Consumers will, will keep spending and and things like that. And it's just going to be kind of a self fulfilling prophecy, right? That the economy will continue to grow and and we'll, we're going to get persistently high inflation. That's what the Fed is worried about. Okay, the Fed is worried about uh, what the what the market is seeing in in its communications. So I don't think the Fed is going to give any kind of clues that it's slowing down its uh, interest rate hikes. Uh, I think it's just going to be business as usual. We're going to continue to ra raise hikes and we're actually going to look at some estimates for what that could look like here over the next couple of, uh, you know, a couple of couple of months. The biggest market moving economic news really this week is going to come on Friday. It's going to be the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, that PCE index. That's the preferred inflation, uh, you know, inflation measure by the Fed. The Fed really uses this one uh, to measure what inflation is looking like, you know, uh, for for consumers and for everyone. It's normally it's the third inflation measure that we get each month. First, usually we get the um, you know, the consumer price index, that CPI, we get that on the 12th of each month. We get the um, the PPI, which the, is the producer price index. So the consumer price index CPI is, you know, what consumers are paying. Producer price index is what producers and, and businesses are paying their kind of inflation. And then here in the, uh, the last days of the month, we get the PCE. Okay. So normally it's kind of an afterthought. We've already seen these other two inflation measures. So we kind of already know what inflation is doing. Uh, and if there's any surprises, so the market doesn't normally look at the, the PCE quite as much, but obviously it's because inflation is so important right now uh, and the Fed moves, the Fed interest rate hikes, it has become much more important. Uh, we are expecting inflation, uh, core PCE inflation, to actually increase uh, you know, when it's reported on Friday. We're actually expecting uh, that core inflation from the PEC, PCE to increase to 5.2% on a year-over-year -year basis. That would be higher than the 4.9% uh, reported last month. So you know, if that, if that inflation reading that we get on Friday is as expected or even a little bit higher, then that's obviously going to spook the markets. Uh, the Fed cannot stop raising interest rates until that comes down. We're going to see some manufacturing services uh, data today on Monday. You know, that's expected to re uh, confirm the economy is slowing a little bit. Uh, the larger the services one is uh, the, the more important because obviously 
excuse me, the services sector is so much larger for the uh, for the U.S. economy. Uh, so we'll be watching that. That is expected to report at 49.7, which anything under 50 for those PMI uh, reports, economic reports, is contraction. So is, is slowing economic growth. And we are expecting to see that for the uh, for the economy. Now I want to uh, I want to look at some of your questions here. I actually asked in our Facebook group, uh, you know, what do you uh, what do you want me to talk about? What questions do you have? So I want to walk through some of these questions, kind of really explain what I'm looking for in the stock market. And again, a lot of this is not necessarily just to answer the questions and, and just tell you, you know, give you my opinion because everyone's got an opinion and, and you know what they all they all smell like. Uh, I want to show you what I'm thinking when I'm when I'm trying to answer these questions, right? When I'm trying to look at the market, what I'm thinking, and, and what I, uh, you know, the the websites and information I use, so you can make your own decisions there. Uh, first question here from Rod, a longtime member of the Bowtie Nation. I appreciate that. Uh, what's the criteria for stocks being removed or replaced in the S&P 500? Okay, um, the S&P 500, that stock market index, 500 largest companies in the United States, and, and really, it's mostly it's just a uh, just that there's just 500 largest market cap companies right it's a market cap weighted uh, index the s p 500 so it's basically the largest market value companies okay so apple tesla amazon right uh you have to have over 8.2 billion dollars in market cap uh so far right now uh to make that cutoff um and you know, there's, I mean, there's some liquidity uh, things in the in the index. So you have to have so many shares traded, or so many, you have to have at least, I think it's like 50% of your available shares uh, or shares available in the market, right? So you can't be controlled by you know a family that owns 60% or 80% of the uh, of the voting shares you have to uh, have to have uh, most of those shares 50% or more trading available out in the market. So, uh, but but I mean, generally, if you're a, if you're a company over eight billion dollars in market value, then uh, there's not a whole lot of companies that can be privately controlled at that size. So mostly, it's a it's just a market value uh, that you have to meet to to get inclusion in the S and P five hundred. There, uh, David wants to know what the strength of the dollar is. It worth considering diversifying into emerging markets like Brazil and India? Okay, um, you know, yeah, this is uh, this is a, a very important question. Great question, uh, and, and the problem here is. You know, yeah, there there are some good effects uh, of a stronger dollar for a lot of these countries, but there's uh, many more bad effects. Okay, there's there's much many more warnings. Uh, one of the biggest warnings for a strong dollar for emerging emerging markets, especially, is that a lot of these countries, a lot of these companies hold a lot of dollar denominated debt. Right? You know, they they go to issue debt, they go to issue bonds. Uh, the companies and the countries go to issue bonds in the market and. You know, nobody wants that that foreign exchange risk, right? These these uh, these currencies jump up and down wildly. Nobody wants to invest in the currencies, even if they want to buy the company's bonds. So the company and the country will it will uh, denominate these bonds, will issue these bonds in dollar terms. Okay, so they might uh, they might raise five hundred million dollars in uh, in bonds in funding. But that's all in dollars. So what happens when the dollar strengthens? What happens when the dollar increases like 20 or 30 percent, like it has over the past year? Well, that 500, uh, you know, that 500 million uh, is in their own currency terms is now 20 or 30 percent more, right? And that's really the stress that we're seeing across emerging markets right now. Is that with that strengthening dollar, any kind of uh, debt that they hold in dollar terms, they have to pay back in dollars. It costs so much more in their own, uh, you know, in their own currency right now. Uh, yes, uh, Brazil has been pretty quick to the uh, quick, pretty quick to to everything uh, as far as trying to fight inflation. Inflation, I think, is about 11% there in Brazil right now, uh, which is actually kind of low for them for, by historical standards. You know, Br Brazil chronically has high inflation in the double digits. Um, and the thing is, with you know, with a weakening currency and the stronger dollar, they import a lot of inflation. Okay, not just in you know paying that paying back that debt, but uh, you know anything they import uh, is is going to be inflated. Uh, it's going to add to inflation. So you're you're not going to see inflation slow down. And a lot of these emerging markets is only going to get worse. What what scares me about in Brazil, they got an election coming up. Uh, it looks like uh, Da Silva, you know, the, one of the former presidents, might come back. He's a little bit more leftist than uh, the, than the current president. Well, well, quite a bit more leftist than the, than the current president, but even more leftist than some of the other presidents that we've seen. 
you know, and and he didn't make didn't always make the best you know business uh, decisions in the in, in the government there. Uh, so I would be I would be cautious about Brazil about emerging markets uh, just because of some of that stress and uh, and that you know and and everybody always talks about emerging markets as uh, being the growth plays right the, the the idea is that they're emerging right and you know what I mean I used to drink this Kool Aid just as much as anyone uh, one of my first analyst jobs was for a uh, a company called Emerging Money. I, I wrote their weekly or I w- wrote their weekly uh, summary, their weekly recap uh, for emerging markets and, and just loved emerging market investing. The problem is, you know, if you look across time, if you look over decades, uh, these countries never emerge. OK, and there's a real big problem with productivity in these countries. Uh, they just never they just never seem to get caught up, right? There's a there's a problem with productivity uh, in in how they do business and and how the governments work. So I would caution, you know, you do need some international exposure. Uh, I would focus a little bit more on the developed markets, but uh, I mean, you can have some some emerging market stocks, some emerging market funds, but I don't think I would focus on those, uh, you know, especially not now with the strength of the dollar. Okay, Kevin wants to know about DXY, so the dollar and its effect on the markets. Kind of covered that just now. Uh, one thing that you you really want to understand about the dollar uh, and the stocks is how much how much money or how much sales a company has overseas. That's really going to be the deciding factor for a lot of these companies reporting their earnings. I'm expecting you know as we uh, you know as we get these earnings reports coming out, a lot of these companies are going to blame their their poor earnings on uh, on the dollar strength. Okay, I want to show you something. This is um, FactSet Earnings Insight. All you out there in the nation know we we use this constantly because uh, this is a very uh, a great great data, great information put out every week by FactSet. And uh, there's one thing, you know, one graph here, it's page 26 of 33 this week. Uh, if you go here, it says geographic revenue exposure. Okay, so this shows the, uh, this one, the first one is the aggregate for the S&P 500. So, you know, how much in sales, uh, percentage of sales that companies in the S&P 500, so the largest 500 companies in the market, uh, what percentage of sales they get from the United States and what percentage is international. And right now you can see as a whole, that's about 60% uh, from the United States and about 40% international. But what's important here is you look at this chart and this shows by sector. So which sectors get most of their sales from the U.S., which sectors get more of their sales from internationally? You see, obviously, you know, utilities, real estate, going to get most of their sales uh, from the U.S. here. Utilities, it's like 98% of their sales is domestic. Real estate is 84%. Um, you know, financials, 79%. You work all the way down here. Information technology. So tech stocks get 40, get only 42% of their sales from uh, from the United States. The, ma- the majority, 58% of uh, companies like you know you cut like apple like your other tech stocks there get 58 percent of their revenue internationally now why this is important for a strong dollar is again as they're booking those sales internationally in those foreign currencies and as the u.s dollar rises as we've seen over this past year over this past three quarters is uh, you know when they translate those weaker foreign foreign currencies into the u.s dollar uh, to report their earnings it they take a big hit okay and so I'm expecting that's what a lot of companies are going to say, why they're missing earnings expectations for this quarter, why they might be a little weak in the coming quarters maybe, is that uh, that, that foreign currency affects on their, on their earnings, okay? So that's uh, one thing you want to you want to understand when you're looking at stocks and, and which sectors and, and which stocks and which sectors to to invest in uh, information technology. So some of the uh, some of the biggest ones here, information technology, 58 percent of their sales overseas materials, 55 percent of their sales overseas, uh, consumer staples, 43 percent. Uh, communication services going to be a lot of your internet names. Uh, they, there's also telecom, obviously, in communication services, but that is much more, you know, U.S. focused. But uh, the internet names in communication services, obviously, mostly uh, overseas. There, 43% of their sales uh, overseas. So that's something you really want to watch for uh, when you're thinking about, you know, the strong dollar and its effect on the uh, on the markets there. Uh, Sheila, Sheila, just talked to Sheila this last week. Uh, what is the best process for rebalancing your portfolio? As we get closer to the year end, right? This is a crazy market, she said, and, and she's kind of wondering, okay, so how to how to rebalance a portfolio? Now, when you think about re- rebalancing, I don't want you, don't necessarily want you to think about rebalancing in terms of okay, what's the market look like? Uh, how do I want to rebalance everything? When you think about rebalancing, I want you to look at okay, 
which assets have sold off, which ones have risen, where can I kind of take profits in my assets for that long-term approach, okay? You've got a target of how much you want in stocks, bonds, real estate, those broad assets, you know, over the long-term, over 10, 20 years, uh, you know, depending on your risk level uh, and, and and your goals. And that's really what you, what you want to use rebalancing for, okay? So I would generally say, okay, you know, maybe once a year towards the towards the end of the year, maybe in October now, uh, then you look at, okay, if stocks have jumped higher, then maybe you take a little bit of money out of stocks and you put them in bonds or you put them in real estate or something like that. Conversely, as we've seen this year, you know, maybe as uh, bonds have held up relatively well against stocks, I know bonds are down for the year uh, and haven't provided that much safety, but they are still doing better than than stocks. Uh, real estate has, has also fallen. But you know, maybe you take a little bit of money out of the bonds or a little bit out of your cash and to buy into stocks and to buy into real estate for those long-term, really those long-term targets. Now, what you can do is you can look at the sectors uh, as far as rebalancing. So if you're if you're thinking about rebalancing your stock portfolio, then you can go here to the sectorspider.com, right? Go to year to date and really see how those sectors have done, you know, and, and maybe so a lot of this, folks, a lot of this is going to depend on, you know, this short term kind of a tactical investing, you know, uh, not that broader picture, but but really uh, what you see as far as the uh, the smaller, you know, the one year picture, the two year pictures, that's going to depend on where you see the market going from here. OK, if you think we have seen a bottom and and we are heading into the next bull market pretty soon, then then uh, you're going to want to you're going to want to invest in the sectors that have been hit hardest. Right. On the other hand, if you do if you do think there's more pain to come, then you're going to want to invest in the safety sectors. You want to still keep that keep that cash and keep those safety sector stocks. So if we do look at what the market has done over the past year, over the past year to date, we see obviously energy is the standout winner, fifty six percent up. You know, so you got to really ask yourself, okay, do you think that can that can last much longer? I think energy is still going to continue to do well on higher oil prices, very much a supply demand picture. And that's a longer term picture for oil. Uh, you look at some of the some of the safety sectors here, consumer staples down 10%. This is all against the S&P 500, the stock market down 21% this year, right? So consumer staples have held up, you've got healthcare, those drug stocks have held up really well. Uh, you've got utilities have held up, and uh, and even financials, even financials, although they've they've been weakened lately, uh, the financials have held up, and that's one thing. One of the things we've been watching uh, financials uh, and with those interest rate hikes, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit as far as what to uh, you know what to what to invest for different stages of the economy. Um, but I want to get uh, I want to get some other questions here. This uh, so Billy asks who will buy the U.S. bonds and save the bond market. I don't necessarily I don't think it needs savings. Uh, yes, the bonds bonds are falling because interest rates are increasing so rapidly, but they are still performing much better than the bonds of other countries. Okay, so we've seen we saw a total collapse of the uh, U.K. bonds, uh, uh, the British uh, the British bonds, the gilts over there that almost caused a crash, a collapse of their pension fund system. That uh, you know the bonds the bonds over there crashed so hard so fast. Uh, so the U.S. bonds, you know, actually doing uh, pretty well in comparison. If you look at uh, one of the things you can look at for, and I want to close some of these tabs so I can actually see what's going on here up here. Uh, if you look at bonds, so U.S. bonds, we'll look at the AGG, which is the iShares Core U.S. Aggregate Bond ETF, right? So kind of a, a big picture idea of the bond market. We'll look at the year to date here. And that's down from 112 down to 90, so it's about uh, you know about about 17 percent I want to say, uh, 93 divided by 112. So yeah, that's ex almost exactly 17 17 percent. So the uh, the 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 core the core bond fund there down 17 percent. We can also look at the BND, which is the Vanguard Total Bond Market Index. That's a good proxy for the entire bond market here. Uh, look at year to date. And that again is 83. It's down to 70. So uh, that's going to be slightly less, maybe 15% is my guess. Uh, so we got 70 divided by 83 minus 1. That's 15%. Okay, so 15.6% down on the BND. Uh, obviously, you know, we just saw the, the S&P 500 is down 21% for the year. So even though uh, the bond market has sold off, it hasn't provided that ultimate protection that we usually see in a, you know, in a stock crash, the bond market has held up uh, the U.S. bond market even more so. Uh, and there is, you know, there is just, there's always, uh, there's always buyers for U.S. bonds. Okay. Um, 
with the strength of the U.S. dollar, a lot of countries are seeing their currencies kind of uh, collapse, uh, you know, devalued. Uh, so they want they want an investment that holds its value. They want to invest in U.S. bonds because it's de- denominated in U.S. dollars, and that's going to uh, that's going to provide an additional return. So not necessarily sure that the the U.S. bond market even needs saving uh, and isn't isn't uh, you know going to hold up pretty well. Uh, I don't see a credit market collapse uh, like the bears say it will. And something you got to understand, folks, a lot of these bears, these perma bears that you get out here, like Michael Burry, like Ray Dalio, uh, like Dent, I, I think it's Harvey Dent. Uh, I always confuse him with the uh, the two face on Batman. But there's a guy named Dent that's been just, you know, preaching a total economic collapse from demographic trends and things like that over the last 10 years, really. A lot of these perma bears, you know, they Rubini is another one. They preach these these huge uh, collapse scenarios, uh, and you know a broken clock is right twice a day, right? So every once in a while, these guys will uh, will seemingly be right because something happens, and of course they crow on that for uh, for for years after that. Michael Burry uh, is very popular right now just because you know he's he's he. He seemingly called the uh, you know the the recession, but if you look at look at what he said in the past, he was he was calling for a complete economic collapse and a stock market collapse as far back as you know 2016 2017. Uh, back then he was saying it was going to be the, going to be the ETFs that were going to bring down the stock market. Right? Do a Google search for uh, for his name and and for news back then. You know, uh, make it by time. Look for 2017, 2016, 2018, and he was call even back then. He was calling for a, a stock market collapse. Okay, and if you would have followed him into some of that those ideas and sold off your stocks, you would have missed out on some huge gains over the next years. Right. So, what I want you to understand, folks, with a lot of these, you know, a, a lot of these investors, a lot of these perma bears you see out in the market, the guys that get popular when the recession hits, and, and you know they seem right, is being early is just as bad as being wrong sometimes. Okay, you know, if you look at Michael Burry again, you know, uh, and I pick on Michael Burry, uh, he's no more right or wrong than a lot of the guys out there like uh, Rubini and things like that. I just pick on him because he's kind of a whiny bitch. Okay, you know, I, I mean, he is. If you follow him, uh, he's shut down his Twitter account so many times because he can't handle the trolls, he can't handle the haters, he can't handle the people pointing out when he's wrong. His Twitter name is Cassandra, which you know, if you know your, um, I actually wrote the the if you know your history, then uh, Cassandra was. Uh, cursed with the ability to see the future and be right, but nobody would believe her, right? So she obviously, she, you know, she had all these prognos- prognostic- prognostications of, of bad news and, and things, but nobody believed her. And of course, she was ended up being right. Well, Michael Burry, with naming his Twitter account Cassandra, he's saying that, oh, he's always right, but nobody believes him. Kind of whiny, if you ask me. Uh, and then the fact that he just shuts off his Twitter account so frequently uh, to hide some of his bad calls. It's kind of why I, I point out his, uh, you know, his more than Rubini and Dalio and, and a lot of these other guys that, that are, uh, you know, Grantham that are always calling for a bear market crash. Uh, but again, you know, you got to understand, uh, especially for Burry, I mean, he was calling for the housing bu- bubble collapse in 2002, 2003. You know, if you actually watch that movie that was made about, you know, his call on the, the housing crash, and, and this is his big claim to fame that he was right about the housing bubble, uh, he almost went bankrupt. And if, if, if it had not been for him saying to his clients, no, I'm not going to return your money because it got got so bad in 2006 that his clients were asking for their money back, were saying, you know what, we've been sitting on this bad bet that you told us to do for so long, we just want our money back, we want out. And he said, no, you know, I'm freezing redemptions, I'm not going to return your money. If it had not been for that, he would have been totally bankrupt. Okay, if you watch the movie, it's, it's clearly right there uh, in the movie. So, you know, he was uh, eventually proved right. Uh, the writing was on the wall by then, obviously, but he was so early that it almost caused a uh, bankruptcy. And, and again, you know, being early in the markets is just as bad as being wrong sometimes. If you're trying to make these these huge calls on the market uh, and you're you're so far, you're so early, then, you know, you're going to be bankrupt. So, you know, you got you to gotta really... You got to really, uh, you know, kind of second guess what these big calls are. I, I mean, listen to these guys. Rubini, uh, he's a smart econo- economist. Burry, you know, he's got he's got a lot of data uh, behind him and stuff like that. Listen to what they say. Kind of analyze what they're saying, what you believe to be true, uh, and then kind of you know kind of look at the other the other ideas as well and and kind of the counter the counters to their ideas to get your make your own opinions okay folks that's that's just what i want you to do make your own opinions don't just follow you know some guy you see on cnbc or, or even youtube uh into into a trade 
what else we got? Paul. Paul, a uh, longtime member of the Bow Bo Tie Nation. Appreciate you there, bud. Uh, for me, it would be which stocks or investments have held up best during the downturn, especially which dividend stocks remain stable and reliable. Okay, great question here. I want to, uh, and there's you know, Paul's question there, uh, which stocks held up in the downturn? So I want to look at two things here uh, for that. One is some data I put together with StockCard. Actually, StockCard put the, put the data together for me. I asked for it uh, to see what, um, you know, how stocks did in the you know, housing market collapse. Okay, so we had that big, obviously the big recession in 2007, 2008, 2009. Stocks fell 50%, uh, you know, on average. The S&P 500 fell 50%. Through uh, through March 9th of 2009, that was the market bottom. So I had StockCard look, uh, just look at it for me. You know, look at which what the sectors did during that time. The market peak, the market hit its peak in uh, October of 2007, fell through March of 2009. But I wanted to see which sectors and which stocks, uh, you know, did better and, and ETFs did better and beat the market. So you see here, I, I mean, it's kind of a no brainer, right? With the sectors, you see the consumer staples uh, sector only fell 28%. That's about half of what the market fell there, there in that recession. Uh, obviously, again, you know, consumer staple stocks, selling food, selling household products, personal products, things you have to buy in a recession, selling uh, adult beverages, right? I need my, I need my Jack Daniels, whether I've got a job or not. So I'm going to be drinking and that's going to be, you know, uh, money for that company. So anyway, consume maybe a little bit more about me than you want to know. But uh, consumer staple select sector spider there, XLP falling 28%, you know, against a 50% drop in the markets. Healthcare, uh, you know, your drug stocks, uh, obviously you need your heart medications when even when a recession hits, fell 38% there during that, uh, that sell-off. Utility sector fell 42%. Okay, uh, utilities, uh, Constellation Energy, NRG Energy, uh, you know, those utility companies, you got to pay your heating bill, you know, whether we have a recession or not. So those safety sectors, obviously, you know, really, really holding up, protecting the uh, protecting investors in that last sell off. Now, the ones that underperformed, okay, financials, financials was obviously a little bit of an outlier here in that last recession, 2008, because, you know, it was it was a financial crisis. So I wouldn't expect financials to sell off so much, you know, in uh, in any other recession, uh, unless we do see another, you know, finance focused financial crisis. Uh, but that fell 81%. Industrials and materials, obviously, uh, you know, uh, fell 62%, 56%, just a little bit more than the market there. So underperformed the market because those are economically cyc cyclical uh, sectors, right? Materials, uh, you know, your miners, your factories, industrials, your factories, manufacturing, things like that. You know that is that is very much going to follow the economy up and down. Uh, then you got your tech st stocks, your energy stocks, things like that. Now let's look at the stocks themselves, and this is really interesting. When I looked at this, um, so we'll toggle off sector here. Okay, so so for the stocks, <clears throat> and it's okay. So it's uh it's it's uh for for the total return. Okay, so these this is how individual stocks uh, did in that in that 2008 2009 sell off from the peak in October 2007 to the trough to the very low March 9th, 2009. Uh, and obviously, you know, you see Netflix here. I think that's kind of the out the outlier, right? Obviously, Netflix had a, an amazing decade there in the 2000s. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily think that that Netflix is going to outperform in any other recession. It's just a matter of it was an amazing growth stock during that decade. Uh, and, and that you want to look at some of these other stocks, though. And what surprised me really when I saw this was AutoZone. You've got uh, where else? You've got O'Reilly Automotive here. You know, AutoZone did 22% in that, uh, you know, that year and a half uh, when stocks were crashing. Uh, O'Reilly Automotive, when the S&P 500 dropped 50%, actually only lost 6%. Okay, so you get an idea that, you know, auto stocks, auto parts companies, I think, well, here we have advanced auto parts too. Uh, that one rose 3%. Uh, so outperformed the market by 53% in that recession. And I think you get a sense that, uh, you know, as, as people stop buying new cars or maybe slow down their car purchases, then they have to fix up their old ones. So they're going to keep on, continue to buy those, uh, those auto parts. So it seems like auto parts do pretty well during a recession. We also have these dollar stores, right? Ross stores. Uh, I think we can lump Walmart in there with some of those with discount stores, right? But you've got Wa Ross stores, you've got Dollar Tree, so you've got discount retailers, okay? And obviously, I think that's, again, that's intuitive. You know, Ross stores rose by 8% uh, 
over that last recession. Uh, Dollar Tree only lost 3% versus a stock market loss of 50%. 50%. Uh, And you really got to think about that, you know, as consumers get kind of squeezed by a recession, they start looking like looking to where their dollar goes further, right? And that's going to be obviously the dollar stores, the discount stores, discount retailers like Ross, uh, Walmart, Walmart held up 7% higher during that recession. Um, What else do we have here? We've got, uh, there's Dollar Tree that we talked about. We've got, uh, there was another one in here for the dollar stores, but we won't uh, we won't go for too far down there. Uh, you've also got a lot of the the drug makers. Okay, so again, obviously, you need your heart medication whether a recession hits or not. Maybe you need more heart medication when a recession hits. So you've got drug makers like Gilead Sciences, um, Baxter International is actually medical equipment, but you've got Abbott Lab- Laboratories. You've got um, where are some of the other uh, where are some of the other Amgen. You've got other uh, other drug makers here, Amgen. Amgen only fell 18% uh, in the economic recession there in 2008. Okay, so you've got drug makers, you've got auto auto parts stores, you've got discount stores, you've got obviously the food, the consumer staples companies, um, you've got uh, companies like General Mills, right, selling that breakfast cereal, selling those pop tarts that we uh, we all love and need. Uh, you've got uh, you've got McCormick is there in the uh, in the consumer staples Hormel Foods. You've got uh, I mean you've got some you've got some surprising ones in here uh, things that you, that you wouldn't normally expect. You've got uh, what else? You've got McDonald's, which is a little bit more you know McDonald's in I think is in the discretionary category, but it is very much a consumer staple I think and very much cheaper food right? You know if you're if you're worried about your budget, then you're going to McDonald's to get that dollar menu or, or whatever they're charging now. It's been been a little bit since I since I've been to McDonald's. Uh, you know, Activision Blizzard's kind of kind of an odd one there. Uh, but so I, I don't know that I normally think that Activision Blizzard or Mastercard would hold up too well in a recession. But uh, but just some great ideas here. You know, Altria, Altria. People are going to be smoking in a recession, uh, whether you know whether they got money or not. People are going to find a way to smoke. So you've got the consumer staples. You've got the uh, the auto parts st- stores. You got the discount stores. You got the drug makers. All of them held up really well in a recession. Now another uh, you know another another uh, piece I want to look at, and this is coming from another question we got. Um, okay, well, let's let's work down this way. Uh, we got Santiago wants to know, I can't find anyone who talks about long-term investing into 3X ETS without talking about how dangerous it can be and saying not to do it. Uh, okay, so what he's talking about is, you know, uh, ETFs like the TQQQ or, you know, UPRO, uh, a lot of these ETFs that provide like 3X leverage on the markets. Okay, so if the QQQ, which is the NASDAQ, uh, the NASDAQ 100, if that falls by 1%, then the way this TQQQ is set up, uh, and we can actually, I can actually show you, show you what that is. TQQQ, ProShares Ultra QQQ. Okay, so if the Nasdaq falls a percent, then the way this is set up, it should rise by three percent, right? Because it's like three x leverage. They use derivatives, they use options, whatever they can do to uh, to really use that three x leverage on that. And so what Santiago is saying here is that he wants to use this uh, use funds like that, ETFs like that to kind of protect him, uh, make a little bit of money as stocks fall. Uh, but he can't find anybody that talks about them in a good way. You know, everybody pointed out how, how dangerous it can be and not to do it. Well, the thing is, you know, if you, if everybody in the room is saying how dangerous something is or advising against it, you got to kind of wonder, okay, well, you know, maybe everyone is right. If everyone is saying, I mean, obviously I'm not saying that, that everyone is always right or the crowd is always right or things like that, but you really got to question, you know, if you're, if you're looking to do something that everybody says is really not a good idea, you, you might want to, you might want to consider it. And what they're saying and what I'm, so what I say when I talk about these is, yeah, you know, if you want to protect your your portfolio from a further down tr- drown draft, right? If you've got a portfolio of stocks that you love, you don't want to sell those stocks because you want to hold them long term, but you're really worried about the market over the short term, then yeah, you know maybe you buy a little bit of these pro shares or or some of the other ones, um, some of the other uh, short ETFs just to just to kind of protect your portfolio. I wouldn't be putting too much money into these though. I wouldn't put so much money into these that it's more of like a speculative bet. You're not trying to make money. You're just trying to protect some of your losses in the rest of your portfolio, right? 
So it's not necessarily, you know, a big gamble uh, that you're trying to make money. You're just trying to protect yourself with, you know, a, a little bit in these. Uh, the big reason why, the two big reasons why people say do not trade these, do not, uh, you know, do not hold these. These are a bad investment is one because of this expense ratio. You know, it is a, you know, that's one of the 0.86% uh, expense ratio is one of the highest you're going to find in ETFs. And a lot of it is because, yeah, they're using those der derivatives. You, they're using those options. There's a very expensive strategy to use. Uh, to get that 3x uh, return. So it's a very expensive, uh, you know, very expensive, especially to hold long term. You know, these aren't the kind of uh, ETFs that you hold long term because you're just constantly losing money in that expense ratio. Okay. Um, the other the other idea is that they don't really track that 3x return uh, very well over the long term. You know, over individual days, they might do uh, very well on that 3x times. You know, the, the the NASDAQ loses a percent, they gain 3%. The NASDAQ rises a percent, they lose 3%. They might do very well tracking over short term. But over long term, that kind of breaks down because of uh, they have to roll over these derivatives, okay? These derivatives, the futures contracts, uh, the swaps, things like that that they use to get that leverage, they have to be rolled over, you know, month to month or, or every couple of months, right? And they have to pay fees for that. They have to pay a spread for that. And that's really, you know, that really detracts from the actual return, the long-term return on these funds. So, you know, the problem with trying to hold these long-term uh, long term investing is that you're not going to get that 3x return. You're going to pay a lot of fees. Uh, and, and so that's really why, you know, why everybody says don't do it for long-term investing. Again, if you're trying to trade, if you're trying to, uh, you know, protect some of you, some of your portfolio a little bit, uh, you know, from uh, from a downdraft in the markets, then then I say you can look at that. You can look at, you know, the TQQQ, some of those ultra ultra shorts. Uh, you know, there's also ones that aren't necessarily completely short. Uh, well, the uh, the the SQQQ is uh, ultra short as well. That's the that's just the ProShares uh, Ultra Short QQQ there, the SQQQ. That's another one that that has that has that big leverage. Uh, so so yeah, uh, you know maybe short term, maybe protection, hedging, that kind of thing, but definitely not long term investing. Uh, Alex, Alex, dear Deep Salmon, uh, good to see you there. I talked to Al Alex a couple of weeks ago. I uh, usually know what I need to hear better to, than I do. Uh, so thanks for that. Love to hear more about what the plan for the next bull market and signs to look for and maybe criteria that you would uh, look to confirm it. Okay, so a great question, you know, kind of kind of the big elephant in the room, right? When does that next bull market start? Uh, what are the signs that I'm looking for to uh, to reach it? And, uh, you know, I've shared my, my investing strategy uh, over the last couple of weeks, not necessarily uh, looking for a bull market, but just looking for when I can be comfortable putting my cash to work at, at what prices, right? You know, it's not necessarily that I'm trying to say that. Uh, so if you if you saw some of those investing strategy videos, I've got cash, I've got about 20, 25% of cash now. I was investing at 3,500 when the S&P 500 hit 3,500, when it hits 20, 3,200, right around there, 3,250. And then again, when it hits 3,000. And those are three points that I'm watching for that I'm going to use some of that cash to uh, to invest in the stocks that I love and, and buy more stocks, right? It's not necessarily saying the stocks are going to stop falling at 3,000. doesn't say that they're necessarily, necessarily even going to hit that 3,000, right? But those are the points, uh, you know, on valuations and stuff that I can be happy, you know, buying into stocks, putting that cash to work. And even if stocks fall further from there. I know I'm getting a great deal. Okay, so I actually did buy, uh, use about a third of my cash to buy into the market at 3,500 when it hit there uh, the Thursday before last. You know when it hit that big, uh, that big fall before this uh, this recent bear market rally. Um, so I did do that. Uh, I'm waiting for the stocks to fall a little bit further again fall below that and really start using more of that cash. Uh, so it's not necessarily when I think when I'm trying to call the next bull market. Now, there are things that I think we're watching for to really see that all the worst news is baked into stocks. Okay. Uh, you know, and again, I, this is something I've talked about lately. I, I think, uh, you know, as the utility, as the winter heating season really ramps up here, December, January, I think it's really going to be a shock how high these utility bill, bills are. Okay. If we get an unseasonably cold winter, uh, like we're expecting, I think the utility bills are going to be very high. Uh, they're already like 30% higher than they were last year on a rate terms. Um, so I think that's going to be a real shock to the consumer. Uh, the market is going to see that consumer spending is going to have to fall because consumers just aren't going to have any more money money in their budget. And that's going to be really the last leg to come out of the market. You know, if consumers if consumer spending isn't going to be there to to help save the market, then um, that's going to be that's going to be something that's going to have to come out of the market. And it's going to bring stock prices lower. Okay.
you know, with that, I think we are going to start seeing the jobs picture change. We're going to start seeing higher unemployment, you know, uh, lower lower jobs numbers each month in that. That's obviously going to be a, another sign that the, the economy is falling. Uh, so really, that's that's what I'm watching for. And you know, I know we've seen we've seen the stock market rebound off of that 3,500 low. Uh, it's about eight percent higher now. Uh, everybody's wondering if okay, if if you need to put all your money to work because the next bull market is here. I just don't see it. You know, I do not see all of this bad news that we could get. I don't see that reflected in the in the economy and in stocks just yet. So I'm waiting. Uh, I'm waiting for that until I really start. Uh, you know, start start investing. Uh, one thing that I do want to show you here. If you're looking at, you know, kind of a sector outlook or which stocks to invest in and kind of that idea of when we do start heading into the next bull market. This is great, uh, great research here by Fidelity. If you, uh, you know, type in Google uh, business, Fidelity business cycle sector uh, approach, something like that, you know, so business Fidelity uh, business cycle investing, equity sector investing, you'll find this, uh, this, this research they did. And, uh, and you come down here, some really interesting research on sectors that perform well in different stages of the economy. Okay, so, so this first one, and they've got another graph that shows this that I'll show you. But this first one is sectors that have performed well in the early cycle. Uh, so just as the economy is turning around from a recession, uh, again, I would expect this wouldn't be until, you know, early next year or... Um, you know, mid next year, probably we're, we'll start seeing that early cycle of economic growth. Uh, and this is what you want to look at, right? You want to look at consumer, consumer discretionary. You want to look at real estate, industrial materials. Uh, you want to look at financials. And why you want to do that is one, those interest rate sensitive sectors. Okay. The interest rate sensitive sectors tend to do the best in those early stages of economic growth. And, and that's obviously, uh, especially the financials, you know, they're making a lot of money off those higher interest rates, but they don't have the, um, the, the big, oh, I guess you can't even see this, can you? Okay. Here we are. So, okay. Again, you go to Google, you type in business cycle approach, fidelity, equity sector investing. You're going to see this. Uh, I'm going to scroll back down here, show you these graphs. Okay. So this, uh, this exhibit three, this first one here is, you know, how sectors have done in the, uh, you know, in the early stage of a economic rebound. And, and again, you know, we're seeing, okay, so interest rate sensitive site, uh, sectors are like real estate, you know, obviously real estate is extremely leveraged, uh, financials, uh, those banks, that's how they make their money on those interest rates. And the idea here is that if interest rates stop increasing, uh, you know, if, if they if they kind of level out, uh, then then uh, you know financials can um, can continue to make money on that. Real estate doesn't have to pay those higher borrowing costs with higher rates. Uh, but you know, if it is the early stages of economic growth, then we don't have to worry too much about uh, you know um, foreclosures. We don't have to worry too much about loan loss de defaults, things like that. Okay, the thing you got to understand, folks, is is with these financials, with bank stocks, you know, they are making tons of money with that interest, the higher interest rates. But investors are worried. Investors are worried about uh, lower loan defaults, right? They're worried about a recession. They're worried about corporate bankruptcies, about consumer bankruptcies. So they're worried that a lot of these banks, you know, are going to have to uh, take a hit on on a lot of the loans that they've made. So that's kind of the balancing act for financials right now and why financials are down. Uh, when you remove that economic picture and you start saying, okay, you know what, the econ economy is starting to grow again, then you've only got the one side of that balancing act. You've only got the idea that, you know, interest rates are high and that banks are making a lot of money. You got uh, real estate, same token. You know, you, you've got, uh, you know, interest rates aren't increasing. We're not going to get see the the real estate, the, the foreclosures and things like that. So real estate can, can continue to grow again. That's why those interest rate sensitive stocks uh, tend to do well in those early stages of the uh, of the rebound. You've also got industrials and materials. Stocks in the industrials and materials sector do well in those first stages because you know they're the most economically sensitive stocks. Okay, those are sectors. Uh, materials, your your miners, your chemical makers, industrials, your factories, your manufacturing. You know, obviously those are going to follow the economy very strongly, and uh, and you know you're going to see that in the uh, in the the first the first uh, innings of an economic rebound. You know, uh, then by the mid cycle phase, you've got these. I want to scroll down here though and show you the the bigger chart because this is a little bit easier to read uh, right here. 
So the early, you know, this uh, across the top here, we've got the four stages of uh, the economy. According to Fidelity, we've got early, you know, where the economy is just starting to rebound. The mid, where it kind of peaks out late, you know, where uh, where the economy is starting to moderate, maybe even starting to fall a little bit. And then you've got a recession where the economy contracts. Now, I think personally, I think we're still right here into, uh, you know, economy corrects, corrects or contracts. So guess just getting into this, we haven't nearly seen the bottom of this economic uh, stage here. Uh, we'll probably see that, I'd say, probably in you know first or second quarter of next year. So the first half of next year, we're going to see that recession. We're going to see the economy correct, contract and, and really hit its low point. So I think we're still we're still kind of in here. Uh, so that means you know by the end of by the end of next year we're probably uh, into this early stage of the economy. Okay, into this early rebound stage. Uh, and, and if you're looking at that. Again, you want to look at financials. Uh, you're going to want to look at those bank stocks. You want to look at the industrials, the uh, even the even the, the economic uh, economically cyclical sectors like industrials, materials, uh, technology stocks are going to be rebounding as we start seeing you know the economy uh, start turning around, things like that. Here in the uh, the in the recession, uh, and and if you're like me, if you do still expect the economy to to continue to weaken, uh, you still expect the the stock market to continue to bake in that economic contraction, that recession. Then you're going to want to stick with those safety sectors, okay? The safety sectors that we've looked at uh, over the you know over the video so far. There's consumer staples, healthcare with drug makers, things like that. Uh, telecommunications, uh, utilities. Uh, you want to stay away from, you know, some maybe the tech stocks. Uh, financials. I think they're, those are still outperforming the market. I still like financials, and I want to be ready in financials for when the economy does rebound. So I kind of like the financials still, though. Uh, you know, on that idea. Let's look at. Uh, so that's Alex. Uh, Sean. Sean has most of us are probably long-term investors married to these trades at current market levels. Uh, talk about when to sell or why time in the market is when time is better than timing timing the market. Okay, a few things, kind of a couple things that kind of worry me worry me about this question. Uh, you say you're you say you're a long-term investor, but then you're you you know you're talking about trading and when to sell and things like that. And and folks, you know the idea a long-term investor you're holding stocks for you know 10, 20 years. Uh, okay, so you're not really looking to when to sell those stocks. The only reason why you would sell a stock is if you're a long-term investor and you really like the company, you've done your research into the company, into the industry. It's one of the best companies in that industry. Uh, so it is a long-term buy and hold forever stock. The only reason why you would sell that is if that uh, that dominance in the industry really changes. You know, if management does something uh, that really ruins the faith of the investor in that company, if uh, if they lose some kind of competitive advantage, right? In your forever stocks, in your long-term stocks, you're looking for within each industry, uh, you know, which which companies just grow grow revenue, grow sales faster than anyone else because they've have got got some, got some kind of advantage, right? Because you know they've got a better delivery system for their product, or they've got innovation in their product, something that is helping them sell more than their competitors and really take that market share. Okay, so the only reason why you would sell is if you start seeing that erode. You know, if you see start seeing competition be more innovative than, than this company, if you start seeing competition, uh, or if you start seeing the company maybe spend less on its uh, capital expenditures, on its investment spending uh, and research and development spending, that might uh, might mean that in the future they lose that competitive competitive advantage. Okay, that's the only reason why really you want to sell these long term names is if you really see a hit to that competitive advantage that's going to make them the best of breed. In in their company or in their in their industry. So you wouldn't necessarily, you know, just sell out of your your long-term stocks if you are a long-term investor. You wouldn't sell out of those stocks uh, just because, you know, you're you're trying to time the market or, you know, you see something something wrong with these or, or things like that. And now what I would say is, you know, you can you can make uh, adjustments to some of these. You can sell some calls or buy some puts, uh, you know, uh, against some of them to, to kind of protect different levels here. But uh, but definitely, you know, don't worry about selling your long term stocks. OK, and every investor, you should have at least five five stocks that you, you're just you love the company. You, you, you think it's a very strong, defensible competitive competitive advantage that's going to last over 10 20 years uh, and that you you can invest in it and you don't have to worry about okay these five forever stocks that you're going to hold uh, you're going to hold forever and you don't have to worry about them that's really the, the kind of stress free investing that you need Okay, Carlos. Carlos wants to know about an outlook in economic sectors. Uh, again, this is gonna this this is gonna depend largely on your outlook in the 
you know, on the on the economy. Okay, so what what I want to do, I want to show you here in fact set earnings insight again, uh, and we're going to go down here to the the sector level bottom up target price versus closing price. Okay, uh, and this is just what the investor, what the analysts, the Wall Street analysts surveyed by FactSet, what they think the uh, target prices are going to be for all the stocks in these sectors versus the closing price now. And so, kind of a, an estimate for return and what their sector level uh, ideas are for these. And so, for some of these, and, and here, you know, I don't want you jumping into communication services or consumer discretionary just because analysts think those are the best returns available over the next year. You really got to kind of question, okay, where are these assumptions coming from? Are these assumptions right? Do I believe in these? What do I think? Okay. But if you do look here, you know, you see analysts think communication stocks in the communication services sector are going to be up 38% over the next year. And basically what they're saying is a lot of these internet stocks, a lot of the social media stocks that have sold off, you know, 50, 60%, because of the ad rates uh, falling, you know, on a recession, they think those are going to rebound. You know, the consumer discretionary stocks, the stocks that, you know, the, the retailers that have fallen so much, they think those are going to be up 34% over the next year. And, and basically what they're saying is that, you know, the market isn't going to get a bad recession, even if we do get a recession, and they're going to see a lot of these stocks that have been hit hardest, they're going to see those rebound. You've got co communication services, consumer discretionary, info technology, um, uh, you know, the, uh, and then on the other side here, you got energy, consumer staples, healthcare. Uh, you know, all kind of underperforming the market, right? And, and it's basically, you know, what's what's worked over the past year. They don't think is going to work in the next year. Now, I would question a lot of these. I, I think maybe over the next year uh, you might see some of this, but I think definitely over the next six months you're still going to see economic weakness. We have not seen the worst of the economy baked into stocks yet. Right, so you're still going to see those consumer staple stocks do very well. You're still going to see utilities do okay. You're still going to see healthcare outperform the market as the market falls further and bakes in the uh, the economic recession, the lower consumer spending, all that kind of thing into into the picture. I still think uh, energy, I still think energy can do very well, right? Uh, we've talked about the supply and demand problem with oil uh, and how. You know how uh, how that we're drawing from that SBR, that Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and how that's going to have to uh, come off and, and really support those oil prices. So I would look for oil. If oil does come down again, you know, come down into the 70s, I, that would be I would be a major buyer of oil stocks and maybe even into the futures market for oil because I think you're going to get some really strong support on oil prices around 70, 75 dollars a barrel. It fell down to 76 dollars a barrel here. Uh, you know, the last couple last month. Uh, and and has since rebounded to eighty five ninety dollars dollars a barrel. So you see some real strong support for oil at that at that level. What else do we see here? Uh, I'd be interested to hear about best option strategies in down and volatile markets. Okay, so option strategies when the market is volatile like this. Uh, so one thing, the biggest thing you got to understand about option strategies is uh, the premiums. So the money you either pay or you collect when you buy or sell an option, a lot of it is based on volatility, right? Because it is the idea that, you know, if this stock or if the market is jumping around a lot, you know, is extremely volatile, then there's a bigger chance that that option becomes in the money or, or goes higher uh, in the money or, or, or whatever. Uh, so those premiums jump in a volat volatile market. Okay, so that's one thing. So if you if you consider that, then uh, a lot of times you want to be selling options into that volatility. Okay, if you think, you know, uh, a lot of obviously this this has to do with your your uh, your assumptions that whether volatility will increase, decrease, or stay the same. You know, if you think, yeah, if you think uh, the the market is gonna is gonna be much more volatile, if you think the market is gonna fall quite a bit more, and and, and that kind of thing, then you know maybe uh, maybe you want to sell, uh, you 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 want to you want to buy options, right? Because as volatility increases, those premiums are gonna increase as well. But generally. The higher the volatility, the better it is to uh, to sell options, right? To s collect those premiums because those premiums are going higher. Now, in a down market, that's the other that's the other consideration here. So, in a down market, you know, if stock prices are falling. Then, one, you can sell call options, right? So, any of the stocks you own, you can sell call options against them. You collect that premium. 
And if those stock prices do fall, then those op options are just going to expire worthless, right? So the people that bought those options off of you, those call options, they're not going to do anything with them. You're going to keep the stock and you're going to keep the premium. That's uh, one of the op one of the strategies I use to protect my money, to protect my stocks. I don't want to sell my stocks because they're long-term, you know, 10, 20 year stocks that I want to hold on to, but maybe I just want to protect some of my downsides. So I'll sell a call option against them. Uh, another strategy in a down market, you know, as stocks fall further, then maybe you, uh, you can uh, you can buy you can buy put options. Okay, so this is this is going to mean you pay money to buy a put option. That's really going to lock in a price that you get, you get for a stock or for the uh, for the market. Okay, and, and that's kind of a hedge. Okay, so again, you don't want to put a lot of money in this because you are you know buying that options. Uh, but they do you know those options will become more valuable if the stock market continues to fall, and it can potentially uh, you know help help protect you from some of the losses. In those, I do have a uh, an options strategy. Um, all the option strategies that I use, I have a video on that. It's a great video, one of my one of the best uh, performing videos on the channel. So if you go to the if you go to the channel, and I'll show you. If you ever have a question, you want to find it in one of the videos here. You go to videos on the channel. You go to the search, and you can go options. And you're going to see all the option strategies. This is the one. This uh, you know five options trading strategies for beginners. That's the five option strategies I tend to use the most, uh, mostly for risk uh, risk hedging and to lower my risk uh, on those. So check that out. It's a great uh, you know great video. A little bit longer, but uh, definitely going to be going to answer all your questions there in options. Okay, uh, Melanie. Melanie wants to know uh, appreciate practical and thoughtful approach investing critical S and P levels. Yeah, you know I, I mean. I think that's so important to have those levels where you're looking at the uh, you're looking at the market and saying, okay, you know what? At this level, I can be comfortable putting my cash to work, uh, investing. Even if the market falls further than that, I'm okay because you know I I, I like the valuation at this level and have three levels. So that gives you uh, that gives you puts your cash to work, right? Like I said, I, I invested when the market hit 3,500 a couple of weeks ago. Uh, when it hit that bottom 3,500, I invested a third of my cash. That cash is now working for me, right? As this market rally, uh, you know, as this bear market rally increases, all three of the, you know, I, I bought some, I bought some of the XLC, which is the tele, the communication services uh, sector spider. I bought some of the, uh, I want to say the XL. I want to say well, some of the XLV, the healthcare sector spider, and then some DraftKings. I bought some DraftKings as well. One of my favorite long-term stocks there. I uh, didn't have very much in it at all uh, until then, but I bought some of that. And all three of those are up now, you know, over the past week, week and a half. But I still have two thirds of the cash that I had. I still have that setting on the sidelines, waiting for stocks to fall because I think stocks can continue to fall, right? So I've got those other two levels that I'm waiting for. Um, you know, that's the best of both worlds, folks. And it's a completely, it's a very much stress free investing, okay? You don't have to watch the market every single day wondering if I should invest now, put that money to work. You know, I don't want to be late. I don't want to be timing the market, all that kind of, all those kinds of problems, all those kind of worries. You've got those three levels. You're watching for those. That's all you you're worried about and uh, and you can invest when the market hits those three levels so so important to have that kind of that kind of big picture idea of investing lifters gym uh, has a question there we'll we'll do that one and then we'll hit hit your uh, your live stream questions q a there uh, how do analysts set price targets this is a big one okay so analysts analysts uh, you know set their price targets based usually based on cash flow based on earnings expectations things like that and uh, you know it's a lot more than you see there on TV you know they might be on CNBC for all of 15 seconds talking about a stock but uh, you know for for every 15 seconds they're probably spending a week you know trying to put together a, a cash flow modeling and a pro forma earnings for that company and to try to try to get a feel for uh, you know what uh, what that stock is going to be worth right so one of the things they do uh, they, they build out their pro forma uh, financial statements right so this is just taking the financial statements of a company and they're using all their assumptions okay their assumptions for so if we if we talk about Facebook right if you take Facebook you take all their financial statements and you're going to do a pro forma financial statement analysis right usually over the next couple of quarters over the next year uh, what you think they're going to get as far as sales uh, what they're going to have to pay in their costs and, and what that's going to mean for their earnings right you're going to do that for all three statements, the cash flow, uh, you can do some cash flow modeling. 
And, uh, and really what goes into this is, okay, you know, for Facebook, it's all about ad rates. You know, do I think, wh what are the economic situations, scenarios that could play out? And what a lot of analysts will do, they'll do like three scenarios, okay? They'll do a blue sky scenario where everything turns out great. They'll do a base case scenario, and then they'll do a bear case scenario, right? Where everything goes wrong for the company, uh, the, the economy f completely falls apart, things like that. And so they'll do different assumptions for each case. Okay, so for for each of these, for uh, the economy, they'll have a, a a blue sky, a bear or a base case, and a bear case scenario for economic growth. Uh, what that means for ad rates, obviously, you know, for every stock you see, you really want to look at the big deciding factors. Okay, for social media, it would be things like you know ad rates. You know, what are they going to be able to get for sales and subscriber growth? Those are the two. You know, that's like ninety percent of uh, the analysis for a social media stock. Okay. So for each of those three scenarios, they would say, okay, you know what, what do I think uh, ad rates are going to grow at, you know, over these three scenarios, if the economy continue or uh, rebounds and starts growing again, if the economy kind of goes on that baseline uh, expectations for, you know, economic slowdown into the first and second quarter, and then rebounds later next year, uh, what is that going to look like? And if the economy totally cra crashes, what is that going to do to ad rates, right? So they're building out expectations for these ad rates, they're building out uh, also expectations for these uh, for subscriber growth, you know, what happens if Facebook is able to turn around its subscriber growth uh, demonstrably? Uh, what if it, it really increases that subscriber growth uh, or versus what if it, it falls even further? So they're taking all these numbers and they're building out that that income statement. They're building out, uh, you know, the, the cash flow analysis, that kind of thing uh, to get them, you know, to get an earnings estimate and, and other, you know, other financial estimates. Then they can take that and say, OK, you know what, what we think, uh, you know, we, they build out a little grid for what they think uh, earnings might look like, you know, in different scenarios and they say, okay, now what are valuations going to look like? Okay, what are, what is that company, what is that stock going to be able to get as far as price to earnings valuations? Okay, and you know, so if investor sentiment is still very low, if the stock market is still crashing, uh, that kind of thing, then obviously those valuations are going to be lower. They might only be able to fetch, you know, uh, 10 or 15 times on a price to earnings scale. So what is that compared to the estimates, the earnings expectations that I'm making for the company? If the market starts rebounding, you know, and we do get a sustainable bull market, um, what are the valuations going to look like in that case? It may be more, more like 15 or 20 times on a price to earnings ratio. And then they apply that to their estimates. That's how they're building out these, uh, these, uh, these analyst targets. Now, one thing you got to understand about analysts is they are always positive, right? Because the, the analysts are kind of beholden to the banks that they work for. Okay, you get all these analysts from JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. Uh, they don't make nearly as much money in their equity, uh, their equity department, their trading floor, as they do investment banking as they do uh, you know, bond issues, right? They make a much, much more in IB and, and bond sales, right? So you know, it does no good for an equity analyst to say that uh, McDonald's shares are gonna tank, you know, are, are completely overvalued and are gonna fall, if that means McDonald's isn't gonna give you know, that bank, the JP Morgan or whatever, isn't gonna give them their business in bonds or you know, uh, acquisitions, IB, right? So that's why you know the vast majority of analysts' uh, commentary and analyst rankings or, or uh, ratings are always positive, right? Like you know, 65, 70 percent of the uh, you know analyst ratings are for buy, buy or strong buy. You know, so it's it's a quite a bit. Uh, it, it's very much. Uh, uh, skewed to that section. So, so, you know, you can look at analyst ratings, you can look at analyst estimates, but you really got to take it with a grain of salt, do your own research and, and figure out what you really think about the, uh, about stocks, you know, not just what some analyst is saying. Um, I want to kind of, uh, go through the, uh, the, uh, the questions here. I'm going to scroll up through the questions on the chat. If you've got a question, let me know in the chat there. Make sure you use a question mark so I know this question and I'll try to uh, get some of these. Again, love seeing all you out there in the Bowtie Nation. Um, you know, Austin, Texas. It was actually in Austin uh, just this last year at a conference. Great city. Love, uh, you know, love the nightlife there in Austin. Uh, Orston says he misses the beer. Yep, we used to have Beer Money Sundays. Uh, I, I changed it to doing the live stream on Monday morning. Get you ready for the week. Uh, but yeah, I miss my beer too. This, this Go Juice coffee just, you know, it wakes me up, but it isn't doing nearly as much. 
What else? Uh, what do you think of the VIX staying elevated as the market as the market is going up? Should they be inverse? Okay, C Christian has a great great idea there. Uh, what do you think about the VIX? So the volatility index, that measure of stock market volatility and risk and that kind of thing, the fear index, what they call it. Uh, why is that elevated even as the market is going up? And it's because you know the market really doesn't believe that this is the end of the bear market. All right, the market really a lot of investors, uh, myself included, don't believe that we've seen the lows in stock prices. Uh, so we are still seeing the VIX uh, fairly, fairly high. You know, if you uh, if you do want to look at, uh, you know, see see an idea of the VIX, we'll go back here. I'll show you where to find that. If you just go to, you can go to Yahoo and type in VIX, not VOX, VIX. Jesus, where is, there is the I. No, it isn't. My fingers are off today. The VIX, the CBOE Volatility Index. It's a little hat, V-I-X. Uh, it's up to 30, which is uh, is pretty well elevated. If you go to year year to date picture, you can see it's uh, pretty much the highest of the year, which is interesting that the uh, you know the market has rebounded about 8% off its lows over the last couple of weeks. But you got to understand, folks, you know a lot of people looking at this bear market, this rally that we've had. 8% off of the off of the low we hit Thursday of the week before last uh, and thinking, okay, hey, maybe this is the next bull market. Uh, the market is really rallying. Uh, how much conviction is in that? But you got to understand, hell, that was only, that was less than two weeks ago. Less than two weeks ago, we saw the bear market low so far. Uh, so it's not necessarily the fact that, uh, you know, we are in a bull market and, and stocks are going to jump higher. Uh, it could be just a, a bear market rally. And that's what I think the VIX is telling us that, you know, a lot of investors are still worried about that, uh, about that bear market rally and and whether stock volatility is over. So I wouldn't necessarily uh, think that that it is. Uh, one thing that that again, like we talked about earlier with the volatility and, and the options, uh, you're, you you got the VIX extremely high here. That does make options investing a very very uh, positive very attractive uh, because those premiums on the options are going to be very high. So I know a lot of you out there, uh, uh, Chad there at uh, Lifters Gym there, uh, you know, he loves the uh, loves the covered call strategies, loves collecting those premiums on his uh, on his stocks. And he's making a lot of money now because, yeah, he's selling those call options against his uh, against his stocks, collecting a lot of money in those premiums because they are so high right now. What else? Uh, who else we got here? Good morning. Thank you for all your advice. Uh, notifications time late. Uh, Joseph, Joseph Floor is the second. Good to see you there, bud. Uh, Joseph, longtime member of the Bowtie Nation there. Um, not sure why you don't have audio. I got audio, so looks like uh, audio is okay. Uh, might just be your your connection there. Uh, UPS Coca-Cola, what's the dividend rate for Coca-Cola? Uh, if you want to find the dividend for a stock, you can always go to, you know, go to the, go to the, uh, Go to this page there on Yahoo Finance. So we'll go to Coca-Cola since you asked about it. You go to the co the page. You see here this forward dividend and yield. So Coca-Cola paying 3.15% right now as a forward dividend. That's basically the, the last quarter's dividend. Uh, assume that they pay that same dividend over the next three quarters. So four quarters worth of dividend or four quarters worth of dividend and, and what that percentage would be on the stock price as it is right now. So that's how you find the, uh, the dividend yield on there. Okay. Uh, well, uh, okay. So Joe says he's got it now. I, good morning from Dallas, Texas. A lot of Texans here. Love seeing it. Um, what else? Lawn care is booming right now. Yeah, we had the. Uh, fortunately, we got the uh, got the the grass cut outside, so we're not having to deal with that anymore. Uh, Garbage monsters. Says, Facebook should buy eBay. That is interesting. That is an, an interesting idea. Um, you know, I think we're we are going to see over the next maybe six months, six or eight months, we are going to see more acquisition activity. And a lot of these tech stocks, a lot of these uh, social media stocks that have sold off so much because they are becoming attractive valuations, uh, you know, for, for acquisitions, for a lot of companies to, to, to buy them out. Uh, what are thoughts on preferred shares ETF? Uh, Richard, Richard wants to know about the PFFA. It's a preferred shares ETF. We're going to, uh, we'll look that up. I do like preferred shares. Uh, I haven't talked uh, as quite as much about the PFFA. I know I, I've usually covered uh, some of the other preferred shares, but we'll just talk about preferred shares in general. Uh, this one does pay a 10% dividend yield, which is a little high. I'd be uh, I'd be kind of worried about dividend sustainability there. With any dividend stock, folks, you got to go into the historical data and kind of look at what it's been paying, uh, the, the history of those dividends. You go here to historical data in Yahoo Finance. You go here to, uh, you can go to five years or max. Uh, 
Uh, then you go to dividends only, you click apply. So you can really see, you know, what it's been paying. So it's been paying that 16, 16 cent per dividend, uh, you know, back it raised it in 2021. Uh, so it has been pretty consistent, you know, 15, uh, 19, it did cut it there in the pandemic, which, you know, a lot of companies did that. So no big deal there, but it's, it's been pretty consistent so far with its dividend payments. So that's good. Um, you want to look at what the share price has done. So has it, you know, have you lost money? You have lost quite a bit of money, uh, you know, over the last, over the last year. But that's a that's a, a factor of you know stocks and uh, and bonds and things like that. Uh, one thing one thing I'll say about this is I do like preferred shares. Basically, preferred shares are uh, special shares a company issues that you know have guaranteed dividend payments. Uh, those dividends get paid out before regular shareholders get paid out. Uh, but then they have a kicker that uh, these preferred shares convert into regular stock, you know, at a certain price, right? So it's kind of a, a kind of a hedge on the stock price of a company, you know, and uh, and a lot of times, especially during a recession or when stocks are falling so much, these preferred shares get discounted quite a bit, and uh, and they 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 rebound. They do really well, you know, when the economy uh, rebounds and these preferred shares get a little bit more likely to exercise and convert it into regular shares. Okay. Cause remember, you know, they convert to regular shares, uh, you know, at a certain price, obviously that's pretty much worthless. If the stock price is falling, those, those preferred shares aren't going to convert, but as stock prices continue to rise higher, these preferred shares, they get closer to conversion and they do well. So that means, you know, these ETFs that hold those preferred shares, they do well. Uh, and they tend to do uh, really well. You know, I like these, these preferred shares ETFs. I usually talk about a little bit more about, um, you know, there's a few others. The PFF is the one I usually look to, uh, or the PFFD. So, you know, the PFF, so we've got 1.2% expense ratio in that other stock. So the, uh, the other preferred shares, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the PFFA, that's the one we were looking at. That's a 1.2% expense ratio, very expensive for, for ETFs, which is why I kind of prefer the PFF. That's only a 0.45% expense ratio, so much lower. Uh, it's going to give you pretty much the same uh, the same return. It only has a 5.1% dividend yield, which I know is obviously much lower than the other one, but, uh, but I think you're going to get a better price return on that. You've also got the PFFD, which is the Global X uh, ETF. Basically the same thing, 6.3% dividend yield, so a little bit higher, uh, and only a 0.23% expense ratio. So, you know, uh, all you out there in the nation, you know I'm a cheap ass, right? Uh, I am usually going to go with the cheaper uh, the cheaper funds, the funds that aren't going to charge me quite as much to hold them, uh, even if I have to give up a little bit of dividend yield, okay? Because, you know, generally, generally a lot of these are investing in the same in the same uh, preferred shares, right? So they're gonna get the same total return, whether that's in the stock price or in the yield. Uh, so higher yield, they're gonna have a little bit lower stock price return. Lower yield, they're gonna have a little bit higher stock price return. But it's generally gonna be about the same. So I wanna be in the cheaper the cheaper ones to own. So that's just why I, why I do those uh, the way I do. Now, if you're a purely dividend investor, then, then yeah, maybe you wanna look for the, the higher dividend yield on those. Uh, what else? Justin, Justin says I has TDoc and Zoom. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, obviously I love TDoc, uh, Teladoc Health. Uh, talked about that earlier in the uh, in the in the live stream. I think they're going to surprise higher on their earnings. I'm holding it for the long term, even if they even if they go negative again this quarter and and spook investors, uh, I'd, I'd pick up more shares on that. Um, Zoom is a little bit uh, more wary about that just because of the competition. You know, obviously I think they they're a very strong leader in uh, that virtual communications, which is obviously a growth industry. Uh, but there's just a lot of competition there with Microsoft. Microsoft and, and Google and Facebook and, and, and all those others that are seeing that. Uh, Mustard Man, Mustard Man says, hurrah, simplify there, brother. Uh, Joseph, uh, I've seen more and more people getting out of Facebook. I have it for five years now. Uh, yeah, you know, Facebook is, is really seeing the existential threat uh, to its company and from the perspective of investors. Okay, I don't necessarily see Facebook falling, uh, you know, or, or uh, becoming, you know, a, a past tense kind of company. Uh, but uh, that is definitely the question that people are asking. Uh, but I, I think, you know, you got to look at the evaluations. You got to look at the usage. Uh, Instagram, again, is still the most popular um, and most widely downloaded app uh, for social media sites. So you got to look at that. You got to look at the fact that Facebook owns, you know, owns all those sites of Facebook, Messenger, uh, uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp, hugely popular overseas outside the U.S. as a communication device. Uh, 
you know, and Facebook and uh, and Instagram, right? So you got to look at that strength, and, and I think they will ultimately turn around. You know, the problems, some a lot of the self in, self induced problems they've had, you know, over the last uh, couple of years. Okay, I'm having a idea. Justin, Justin says, thanks for the barbell approach. And exactly, I love the barbell approach. It's something we've talked about, something I'm using in my portfolio right now. Really gives me the ability to hold so much cash because, you know, like I said, I've got about 20, 25% of my portfolio in cash waiting for stocks to fall. Uh, way more than I would normally recommend for people and way more than you see, you know, in the market. Most asset managers right now, I think have about 6% uh, cash holdings on average. That is uh, the, the highest in decades. So even that is only 5 or 6% though. So very much lower than, than I'm holding. But what how I'm balancing that is by holding, okay, cash. So very safe, you know, safe investment there. You know, maybe some cash like bonds and money market, things like that. Um, but I'm balancing that with the tech stocks, with the uh, with the uh, you know growth stocks like Teladoc, like SoFi, like PayPal. Uh, so it's a barbell approach, okay? So if you think about a barbell, all your weight is at the two sides and there's nothing in the middle. So I still have some dividends, I still have some value stocks, some things like that, but it is very much a portfolio concentrated at the ends. Now what this is gonna do is it's going to, if the market rebounds, I've got enough of those growth stocks, those very much uh, cyclical stocks, that those are gonna rebound and take my portfolio up higher than uh, you know than the value or the dividend stocks would. If the market keeps on falling, I've got that cash set aside, right? That I can take advantage of those lower market prices. So I've really got the best of both worlds. Uh, you know, if I just had a lot in, in value and dividend stocks, uh, you know, and cash, then my my portfolio would probably underperform, right? Because the value in the dividend stocks wouldn't rise quite as much as the growth stocks, you know, in the market recovery, and then the cash would be a drag on my returns, right? So not quite what I would want there. If I only had the growth stocks, then obviously if the market just falls, continues to fall apart, then I would be, I'd be hurting there. So I want that cash. I want that cash available to take advantage of those prices, but I want something that's going to that's going to take my portfolio higher if the market does recover. All of <clears throat> usually at work. Chris says usually at work while his guru is live. Thank you, sir. Hey, I appreciate it. You know, I, I mean, these, I love these live streams. Trying to do these every other week, just so I, you know, get out, uh, get out there and talk to you. A little bit more personal, face to face connection here in the live stream. So great to uh, great to connect with you with you there. Uh, Alphabet meta platforms. Can we go back to when we didn't have a Federal Reserve, please? Uh, yeah, Justin wants to go back before we had a Federal Reserve. Actually, that's not a great idea because, yeah, I mean, you know, as as many mistakes as the Fed has made, uh, they do tend to, you know, it's 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 they they I think they they cause those that economic cycle a lot of times, but they also protect us from the worst crashes that we've seen, you know, the worst types of, of bank runs and things like that. You know, if you ever want a great book on, uh, on economic crashes and, and economic, you know, finance stock market history, uh, I want to show you this because this is one of my favorite books. Um, you know, this is uh, history. You type in, uh, type in your Google, you know, history of the U.S. in five stock market crashes market crashes and you'll find it it's by scott nations he's a cnbc contributor um uh, you know go to the amazon page for it uh and, you know i mean i i won't even give you my link here so this isn't this isn't like something i'm going to get a, a kickback on i've got it on kindle it's only 15 bucks it is a great book for you know seeing that there's five stock market crashes all the way back to i think he covers the 1907 1930 crash uh 1980 uh, the 87 crash the uh, all the way up to I think the most recent he does is the 2008 crash in this book, and it's just a really great entertaining look at the finance, the history of the stock market in the United States, how everything has worked together in this, and it's really interesting how, you know, the Fed has acted in each of these crashes, how the Fed has caused some of the crashes, how uh, you know how how trading and uh, you know shorting has, has caused some of the crashes. It's just a really, really interesting book uh, you know, to read if you ever want, if you ever want to see a, a real good look into some of the crashes in the past. 
Uh, do we see pipeline stocks like KMI having the same support as oil stocks? That's a great question. Uh, Fat Zeus, <laughs> Fat Zeus 76 wants to know if we see pipeline stocks. So those MLPs, master limited partnerships, other pipeline owners like KMI. I know KMI is not a Kinder Morgan is not a pipe or not an MLP anymore, uh, but they still own those pipelines. Uh, so is there as much support for them as oil stocks? Now, yes, uh, you know, as as long as you have that support for oil, you're going to have support for for pipeline stocks as well. There is a disconnect there and that those pipeline stocks, those companies, they generally have higher fee revenue rather than price sensitive revenue, but it's still going to be very sensitive to oil prices. So if you see support for oil prices and strong oil prices, you know, going forward, then the pipelines are going to do well. Okay. Um, you know, as long as, as long as we need, we need to pump that stuff through the, uh, through the pipelines and then, you know, processing and all that kind of thing. So, so yeah, I do like the pipelines. I actually own the AMLP, which is the pipeline ETF. Um, I own own, you know, have owned KMI in the past. It's a really well-run company, great company. The, uh, you know, Rich Kinder there, um, he's always buying more shares. So he, he's got a very, very strong interest in the, uh, in the stock as well. Um, so yeah, I like, I like pipeline stocks there. Uh, DDD wants to know which energy, energy stocks are the best. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, all you out there in the nation, you know, I, I own shares of Chevron. I hold those. I own uh, Devon Energy, Fang, uh, you know, Diamondback Energy, which is ticker F-A-N-G. Devon Energy is D-V-N. Uh, CVX is ticker CVX or Chevron is ticker CVX. Uh, very well run companies. Uh, they, they've got a lot of their money in the Permian Basin. Uh, one, actually, I, I think, actually, we've got a video coming up this week uh, on the Bowtie Index, a new index we just launched over the last couple of weeks, really ex really exploring these best of breed stocks, the top 10% of the stocks in the, uh, you know, in the stock market that I'm investing in uh, and where those are at. And actually in those, the only energy stock to make the list was ConocoPhillips, ticker COP. I'm going to obviously wait for that, uh, that, in, that video later on in the week to see that. But you know, and, and a lot of that, why, why I still own Chevron, I still own Devon, I still own some of these other stocks, uh, but we're only buying the ConocoPhillips, only buying the COP for that index is because of some of the quantitative factors, right? The sales growth, margin growth, margin, a uh, lot, lot of things like that. Conoco has done, done an amazing job at growing its sales faster than the uh, peers in its industry. Very good job at uh, its operating margin becoming more efficient. And what you see here with ConocoPhillips is that, okay, it's got a lot of exposure to its... Uh, it's Permian Basin. Okay, if you look at where the U.S. drillers are taking the oil out from the Bakken up there in North Dakota, uh, you know you've got uh, the Bakken, you've got the uh, Permian, and then you've got uh, the other big one out there is in the Northeast. I can, I can never remember. You know, you got some Appalachian things like that. But it's really the Permian Basin there in um, the Midlands, Texas, uh, right right around there is uh, is really uh, the lowest cost to produce, right? So you, if you look for companies, energy companies that are producing most of their production from there, they're gonna have that lowest cost to produce and gonna have the highest cash flows, right? And we really see that from ConocoPhillips. They're letting a lot of their Bakken and, and other assets kind of fall off uh, and they're only they're reinvesting more heavily in the Permian Basin over the next over the next 10 years, Conoco is gonna have about 50% of its business in the Permian Basin there. Management is also very much disciplined in its uh, expenses, in its cash flow, uh, you know, spending. I think uh, management has set a cap at like eight billion dollars a year in its capital spending. So spending on new production and on oil production, that should be just enough to grow production just a little bit marginally, a few percent each year. But it's really kind of a uh, you know cash protection uh, plan. Uh, so you know it, uh, they they might not benefit quite as much if oil prices just jump higher, uh, but they will be the safer play. And and, and are very well run. So I like ConocoPhillips. I still like Devon, uh, Fang, uh, Diamondback Energy as well, and, and Chevron. Uh, all three, all four there really have very low cost of production and are going to be just cash flow machines for your for your portfolio. Uh, where do we get a sector PE ratios for comparison relative to individual companies? Great question there, BJ. Uh, 
BJ, okay, and, and I want to, you know, Melanie. Melanie has uh, keeps uh, posting the the comments. You know, subscribe, uh, hit the like button, and subscribe. Things I appreciate that I do. Uh, the the chat kind of limits them. I think I don't know why. I don't know if the the chat has some kind of limit on you know what you can say in the chat. But uh, you know, I'm trying to show show your comments when I see that they're hidden on there. But back to BJ, uh, you say uh, sector PE ratios. Okay, so we're gonna look at that because I I love that question. Um, I think it's an important question here. I want to look at this again this is the fact set earnings insight okay so just go go to google type in uh you know fact set fact set earnings insight uh it's a weekly report they put out they update every week it's lots of information here uh and for your question the sector pe ratios um we're going to scroll all the way down you can always see it because it's a multicolored chart here blue green here we go these are the sector level forward PE ratios, 12 month PE ratios. So again, you got to understand what this shows to understand really what it is. The PE ratio, price to earnings. Okay, so this is the price of all the stocks in each sector. So consumer discretionary sector right here, all the stocks in the S&P 500, the price of those stocks divided by the forward 12 month earnings. Okay, so now forward earnings, that's what analysts expect over the next 12 months. So very important here that you understand, this is what analysts are expecting for those earnings. Uh, if you if you believe those analysts, I actually believe earnings are gonna be lower over the next 12 months. They have to, uh, you know, they have to build in recession uh, into those earnings. So earnings aren't going to be quite so high. So these PE ratios are not going to be quite as attractive as they look right here. Okay, these PE ratios. So if we look at, you know, the uh, we got each sector, each sector right here, consumer discretionary. We got each sector. The forward PE ratio right now, the dark blue, uh, it's saying consumer discretionary is about 22 times 22.3. Okay, we've got the five-year average in light blue, and the green is the 10-year average. So long-term PE ratio for these stocks uh, in the each sector at in green here. Now, what I'm saying is that if that earnings over the next 12 months, if it is lower than expected, which I believe it is because we're going to hit it, hit a recession, consumer spending is going to go lower, we are going to see higher unemployment, then, uh, you know, that E part of this, the E, the PE, e part of the PE ratio is going to be lower. Uh, so, you know, that PE ratio is going to be higher, right? If you've got, you know, 100 in the price and 50 for the earnings, that is 100 divided by 50, that's two. Now, if you lower that E down to 25, right, 100 divided by 25 is four. So it's a much higher PE ratio. So you gotta take these with a grain of salt that these, uh, these PE ratios might not be quite as attractive as they look. But you know your question was how do we find these to compare them against individual stocks? You know to find the stocks trading you know more cheaply than uh, than the rest of the market. So this is you know, a great resource uh, and it's a great way to just see you know on average which sectors are uh, are least less expensive as well, right? You still see consumer discretionary trading at 22.3 times on a forward PE ratio. Uh, you know despite the the sector you know having fallen like you know 30 percent uh, over the last you know so far year to date. It's still relatively expensive 22.3 the 10-year average is only 22.1 so it is actually still more expensive than it has been in the past 10 years so very still the consumer discretionary sector those retailers still very much an expensive sector you've also got uh, information technology tech stocks 19 times on a pe ratio against 18.5 over the last 10 years so still fairly expensive there consumer staples still uh, right about right at about its 10-year average uh, let's go to the other side, though. Let's go to the, the stocks that are uh, relatively cheap compared to their long-term average. Energy stocks. Energy stocks. It's trading at 9.3 times on a forward P.E. ratio. Of course, obviously, this is still on the assumption that those analysts are right with their earnings expectations and that uh, energy companies will be pumping out that money you know, along with the oil over the next year. So this is saying that energy stocks are now trading at 9.3 times on a price to earnings ratio compared to 15.7 on that longer term average. Uh, financials, one of my favorite sectors here, 11.2 times price to earnings versus 13 times on the uh, that long term average. So financials still very much uh, attractive as far as PE ratio. And again, you know, I don't think the, the financials are nearly as bad as uh, as they appear in the stock prices. 
You know, I think those financials, uh, the earnings have come down a lot just because they're moving that money from the income statement into their balance sheet for those loan loss reserves. Okay, something we've talked about on the channel, something you have to understand, you have to watch on these bank stocks, on these financials. They've got a reserve account, a cash account on their balance sheet that they, they have for just what if. You know, they have that cash account, that loan loss reserves. If the, uh, if the sell out, if the economy gets bad, if loans start to default, if people stop repaying their loans, if companies stop repaying their loans, they want this cash account set aside just in case that happens, right? So what they do is they take money out of their earnings or out of their income statement, you know, after sales, they say we we booked all these sales for this quarter, uh, but we don't we, we don't know if all these loans that we made during the quarter we don't know if those are actually going to be paid. Okay, so we want to take some of that money that we made in those uh, you know some of those that revenue some of those sales and we want to put them in this cash account. And now that gen that lowers their earnings. Okay, so you get this big earnings drop in banks because they moved this money into a cash account. But you know what? They still have that cash. They still have that cash. If the economy does fall apart, then they have that cash that can offset some of those loan loss defaults, you know, some of that bad news. If the economy doesn't fall though, if the, uh, you know, if the economy, if those loan loss defaults never materialize, they still have that cash. And what happens in the reverse, they bring that cash off of their balance sheet, put it back into their earnings and their earnings surprise higher. Okay. That's what we've seen during, that's what we saw during the pandemic. You know, that's what I believe we're going to see over the next year. I do see a recession, but I don't see it being a bad recession. And I think the banks are going to have a lot of money to move back into their earnings and going to surprise on the upside. So I think this is a great time to be looking at the financials, the bank stocks, you know, and be ready for that. Uh, other sectors here, materials trading for 13.3 uh, price to earnings versus 16.3 long term communication services, 13.9 versus 15.8 long term. Uh, again, that's a lot of those Internet stocks, those social media stocks that have just been hammered uh, over this past uh, year, six months. Uh, you know, because of those those lower ad rates. Uh, and, and again, you know, for that, that's something you got to ask yourself. Do you think we're really going to stop uh, being on social media sites? You know, sites like Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, uh, things like that, YouTube uh, and Google, uh, you know, as soon as the economy recovers and it will eventually recover. I know it's it's uh, hard to see that light at the end of the tunnel, but it will eventually recover. And those ad rates are going to go higher. You know, we are spending more and more time online. Uh, ad rates, uh, you know, over time are going up online. Uh, and those social media stocks are looking really attractive on a long-term basis right now. So just one way to, uh, to kind of compare the uh, the economic sectors uh, with stocks and, and things like that. So great question there by uh, BJ. Uh, not sold any stocks since the inflation hit. Okay, Vape King says he hasn't sold any stocks since inflation hit. Portfolio is at a loss, but um, you know, only a matter of time before it's all green again. Great perspective. I love that. You know, um, Folks, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I love talking stocks. I love talking, uh, you know, what to invest in now, what to buy, all that kind of stuff. But 99% of investing is just picking those companies you really love and holding on to them no matter what. Investing every single month. Uh, you know, you can separate that into a core satellite strategy that we talk about, you know, where you have a core ETFs and maybe a couple of stocks that you just hold and you, you don't even look at them because you love them and you're going to hold them for 10 or 20 years. You play around maybe with that extra 20% in your satellite portion uh, and you can do kind of the trading and, and the strategies with that. But uh, the majority of, uh, of investing, man, just just make it easy on yourself. Just just have that that core part, your 70, 80 percent of your portfolio that is just set it and forget it buy and hold forever and you're going to do well okay you you're gonna you're gonna save your time you don't have to listen to a, a guy in a bow tie every week for what you should buy and you're going to be happier for it okay so just you know have that long-term mentality like a vape king here and and be happy man um what else troy troy says do you think there is a point where the fed stops trying to fight inflation no never nope uh, there, there will never come a time when the Fed stops trying to fight inflation. Uh, now they will slow down their interest rate increases. They will pause their interest rate increases. You know, um, and, and but I don't necess I don't think they're going to give up uh, with inflation and just say, hey, we're going to have higher inflation. They can't. You know, they because we have seen. Okay, you know, uh, I was only, I was only four, I guess, when the '70s ended. You know, so don't really ex haven't experienced a lot of that. But you know, it was a very bad time, very rough time for consumers when inflation is you know 10, 15 percent a year. Uh, that destroys savers. It destroys anyone on a fixed income, anyone in bonds. You know, the older people uh, out there. 
It just destroys their savings, destroys their investments, uh, and, and it is it is not something we want to ever see again. Uh, and uh, you know the Fed will not will not stop trying to fight inflation. Uh, now they 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 could they could say say that okay we've raised interest rates quite a bit, uh, but we're going to slow down and just kind of see how the economy reacts to that and inflation. Uh, but they won't they'll never stop. Okay. Um, one of the things that one of the things I do want to show you uh, is kind of how I track. Uh, you know the Fed interest rate increases, and uh, you know what I what I think the market is expecting, and if I believe you know we have more interest rate increases uh, to come, and how that's going to affect stocks. If you go here to the CME group, that's the CME Fed Watch tool. This is so type into Google CME Fed Watch tool, you get a get an idea here, and um, this is basically the market expectation. So what's built into bonds and rates and stocks as far as uh, expectations for the Federal Reserve interest rates, right? See so if you look here, you've got the Fed meetings up in the top here. So we've got uh, you know the next Fed meeting is the second of November coming up real soon. Uh, it's going to be the second of November. The Fed is going to raise interest rates again. They've got another meeting on December fourteenth. Another meeting February first, uh, and then you know here's all of next year's meetings. And then here at the bottom, you see this current rate target is 300 to 325. That's in basis points. So that's 3% to 3.25% is what the Fed is currently targeting for its interest rate, its Fed funds rate. And, you know, that's not necessarily the interest rate in the economy, uh, but all interest rates are basically, you know, kind of guided by this. You know, the 10-year treasury rate, the mortgage rates, all that kind of rise as the Fed increases its own target rate. Um, and we won't get into the econ economics on how they, you know, how they manipulate this target rate uh, to to really get rates into that range. But uh, so you can see here, it's between 300 and 325. So three and a quarter percent is the high end of their target rate uh, for this. And we can see that the market is right now pricing in for this next meeting for November that their target rate is going to be 375 to 400. So a 0.75 interest interest rate increase in their next meeting coming up in November. Okay, that's going to be the fifth interest rate hike of 0.75%, which is historic. They have to my to my remember they've never done this uh you know that much that fast uh only volker in the uh you know in the early 80s raised rates that fast and in in fact if we look we we do see data that the fed is raising interest rates faster than it has in more than 40 years um which really means a lot for the economy. You know, we haven't seen a lot of these economic effects uh, from the interest rates come through yet. Uh, we've seen mortgages double over the past year. We've seen, uh, you know, a lot of these, but we haven't seen the economy really fall apart uh, because they're raising interest rates so fast. But now if you go out, out, out here to the later dates, so that's, so remember the high target 400 by November. If we look at December, the market is expecting the Fed, you know, about 40, about 43%, uh, probability or odds that the Fed raises by another 50 basis points. So half a half a percent hike in December, 53% uh, though pro probability they raise by another 75 basis points. So another three quarters of a percent uh, interest rate hike in December. It's really in February where you start seeing the market kind of expecting them to stop or pause or slow down their interest rate hikes. Okay, but you know you gotta you gotta look at this on terms on the absolute value as well. Okay, yeah, you know it's gonna it's gonna help support the market if the Fed slows down or you know stops those interest rate hikes. But again, this would mean okay five percent here target rate by February. 5% that, that it was zero last year. That would mean a 5% increase in interest rates in one year. That is historic folks. And that will, it will take, you know, time for that to flow through the economy and slow down the economy. So a wall street journal report, uh, just yesterday, actually that measured the time that it takes for interest rate increases to affect the economy. And it was as much as six months for the, uh, for the general economy for jobs and, and other things. And as much as, as much as a year for inflation. Okay, so what what this is saying is that you know the uh, the Fed increasing interest rates so quickly, it is it we're only going to start seeing the effects of this, the worst of it, within the next six months or eight months here after you know after December when they stop or after February when they stop. It's going to be all of the first half of next year where we're really going to see the economy grinding to a halt. And, uh, and inflation might not be coming down yet. You know, inflation might be persistent. It might be, uh, you know, uh, it might take up to a year, a year and a half for inflation to really start coming down. So I think that is going to spook the markets. Markets are going to think, hey, inflation isn't coming down fast enough. The economy is still contracting. And, uh, 
And the Fed is just going to have to keep interest rates higher for longer and really even slow down the economy even more uh, just to, you know, just to, to, to bring inflation down uh, eventually. So, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's really kind of what I'm looking at. Uh, what else? Uh, new paint color looks good. Thanks. I appreciate it. That's Metis. Metis Thefley says the new paint color looks good. Yeah, I, we originally, we moved in about two months ago and I, I painted a very dark green. It was horrible. I don't ever want to talk about it again uh, because it was just way too green. But I, I've since repainted and I think it looks uh, a lot easier on the eyes. So I appreciate that. Uh, Favor 10. Greetings from Ter Germany, land of the foolish political clowns. You know, you don't have a monopoly on political clowns there in Germany, buddy. I got to tell you, we got just as many here in the United States. And in fact, here in November, we're going to be uh, electing a new set. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's just the one standard across all countries. The one thing we can all agree on is uh, po politics are, are generally clowns in general, anywhere you go. Uh, what else? So getting away from responsibilities. How many stock market will... How more, okay, what do you think about NEO? Uh, some of these, you know, some of these, I really haven't looked at the individual stocks. You know, Cameron wants to know about uh, how much further will the stock market go down or what about NEO? So Chinese stocks, obviously Chinese stocks getting hit this morning. Uh, you know, as we've seen, uh, China's President Xi, uh, Xi uh, really tightened his grip on the government much more than was expected. We did expect him to get that third term. Uh, it was, you know, all but a done deal, but we didn't expect him to really load the government with his cronies and you know his yes men and things like that so he's got very much more tighter control on the government there in china and that's really spooked the markets for these chinese stocks so that's why they're falling the in the in the morning session today uh again i still like alibaba i'll pick up shares i'll probably pick up shares here this morning uh you know eventually uh but um you know that, that's uh, that's what you're looking at for for those what else? okay thoughts on lose uh, some of these stocks I, I just have not looked at in, in so long that I really can't give you a, a quick snapshot idea of them. Uh, you know, uh, somebody asked about Lowe's there. Uh, what do you, uh, who was that? Teldy or Teddy, Teddy, the stock picking poodle wants to know thoughts on Lowe's. Uh, you know, I, I'm not positive on the, the home repair stocks. Uh, just because, I mean, so much of their business is from contractors is, is and is from, you know, larger construction. And, and I think construction is obviously going to have to slow down on uh, on the housing market, you know, as we start seeing prices do come down. So uh, what you, what you got to understand about real estate and the housing market, uh, it generally lags, you know, the rest of the stocks and the rest of the market. So, you know, even if even if the economy and the stock market does start to rebound, you know, the uh, the housing market continues to, to lag a little bit. So we could still be uh, in for a little bit more weakness uh, for, you know, at least another, you know, six months or a year on the housing market. And that's obviously going to weigh on sentiment on stocks like Lowe's, Home Depot, things like that. What else? Keeping all my stocks, they're like a bunch of puppies. Not exactly sure what that means. Keeping all my stocks, they're like a bunch of, maybe a bunch of puppies? That would be nice. Uh, I don't know about a bunch of puppies. I, I don't know who out there's punching puppies there, snow file, but uh, hey, you do what you, do you but uh, what else do we have? What do you think? Outlook for medical REIT stocks uh, for dividends payouts to balance out sectors weak growth. Okay, so medical REIT stocks, uh, you know, uh, medical REITs, uh, specifically MPW is a stock that I've held, and I like uh, medical properties uh, REIT, that's ticker MPW. Um, it's been hit hard. Uh, all the hospital stocks have been hit hard, uh, just especially on the recent earnings we've gotten from some of the hospitals. But this is a great long-term theme. Okay, you know we are only spending more money for for medical care, for uh, you know in healthcare, and uh, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of the problem in those earnings uh, that we've seen, you know, over the past for Tenet Healthcare, for HCA Healthcare, I know fell hard last year, last week when when Tenet reported its. Uh, earnings. But the thing is, you got to understand with those earnings, a lot of that earnings hit was from costs, was from higher, uh, you know, higher costs to those, uh, 
you know, to those hospitals, right? The staffing costs and staffing shortages, things like that. Well, the medical REITs, they really don't have that because a lot of the medical REITs tr operate on a triple net beat basis. Okay. So these medical REITs like MPW, what they do, they buy the, they buy the hospitals and then lease them back, rent them back to the companies uh, on a triple net lease basis. And that means that the tenant, this hospital, they're paying all the costs. So they're paying all, you know, all the costs to that property and then just kicking back a check to, uh, to the property owner, to MPW you know, at the end of the month, at the end of the you know, quarter, whatever their terms are. So the, uh, the, the hospital REITs, you know, the, the, the real estate companies that actually own the hospitals really don't have those staffing costs and a lot of the costs and expenses that are bringing down earnings for the, for, excuse me, for the hospitals themselves. Now, of course, if we do see a total collapse of the hospital system because of those costs, then that's going to hurt the hospital REITs. But we're not looking at that, obviously. Um, I think a lot of the problem with uh, MPW, a lot of the reason why it's come down, you know, people are afraid of... Um, uh, bankruptcies by its tenants. You know, uh, there was one bankruptcy reported by a tenant of MPW that brought the stairs down. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, you would have to see a total collapse of the healthcare system, of the hospital system to really bring that stock down, uh, you know, uh, down to the bottom. So I actually picked up shares of MPW last week. I think it's a great long-term play. It's very strong dividend yield. Uh, I think all, uh, as high as 10% on that, you know, and, and a very consistent dividend for that stock. So I do like the medical REITs and the hospital REITs in particular. Vape King says, I can't take the perma very seriously. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, some guys, you know, the, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And to these perma bears like, you know, Dalio and Burry and Grantham and Rubini, uh, you know, everything looks like a bear market and it always will. So they're smart guys. Rubini, he's got a new book out this month, uh, you know, the, the biggest crash scenarios in history or something like that, uh, that looks interesting uh, because, you know, he's got good ideas, but you got to take it with a grain of salt. You got to take those ideas and say, okay, you know what? Yeah, but... You know, these other things, these other factors, we're not going to get a total collapse of anything. Uh, but, but, you know, just, just hear what they have to say and then, and then kind of put in a realistic situation to it. Okay. Uh, well, rather bunch. <laughs> so, yep. Snow Fire says bunch, not a punch of puppies, but a bunch of puppies. Uh, so we amend that as <laughs> every stock in noble collection has collection of daily dividends too. This is my favorite channel. V O O. Need it. You don't have a job. Uh, what else? Uh, love the chat in the. Uh, you know, love the back and forth in the chat. Um, McDonald's did well. So yeah, talking about you know stocks that did well over the last recession. McDonald's did very well. You know that dollar menu. If people's budgets gets tight, hey, you know you gotta you gotta spend money where it gets more, and you get more calories in those those do McDonald's McDonald's Happy Meals than you get in pretty much anything else. Um, so if that's how you're gonna feed your family, I guess. Um, what else? Uh, it is actually about two hours into this. My throat's my my voice is starting to give out. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get over there and, and buy some more shares. Uh, see what the market's actually doing this morning. I appreciate everybody being here. You know I love these these face to face uh, conversations with you every other every other week. Uh, I've got a great video for you tomorrow and the next day. Uh, really kind of a back to the future theme for you uh, in tomorrow's video. So check that out because it's gonna be a really fun video. The most fun I've had in a long time doing a video. So watch for that video tomorrow and. I will see you in uh, I will see you in the videos.